I don't think that's a Mila thing. I think that's how it is generally in machine learning. It's like there's a lot of ignorance. You know, let's just like cross our fingers and just hope that the thing is aligned. You know, we'll train it to to do what we want and like hopefully it does. To have it be like existentially safe, the the bar seems really really high and I don't think we're going to get there. The inside view. The inside view. The inside view. David, you're an assistant professor at the University of Cambridge and got your PhD from Mila. Your research group focuses on aligning deep learning systems, but you're also interested in governance and global coordination. You're famous in Cambridge for not having an AI alignment research agenda per se, and instead you try to enable your seven PhD students to drive their own research. And in Cambridge, your students call you the Krug, or DK, short for David Kruger. And it's a pleasure to have the man itself on the show. Thanks, David, for joining us. Wow, yeah. I've, I've never heard them call me that to my face. So, <laughs> <laughs> What's the like, most realistic scenario you have for um, existential risk from AI? I mean, I think you can think about it happening through, like, yeah, social manipulation and just like being able to trick people and getting people to do to take the actions in the world that you need to in order to like seize control. Um, or yeah, you can think about like, you know, it becomes really easy to actually like solve robotics and build robots. And we're doing that. And like, maybe that's just because we've solved it. Maybe that's because um, once AI gets smart enough, it can just like do the AI research or the robotics research necessary to build robots um, that actually work. Um, yeah. I think like, so a couple, a couple scenarios that I think people maybe don't think about quite enough would be like geopolitical conflicts that like in the worst case, maybe end up being like military conflicts of like total war, but even falling short of that, you can have like sort of security conflicts and, um, geopolitical conflicts that are, uh, you know, that are being waged in the domain of like cyber warfare and information warfare. And I think, you know, in, in normal times, times of not total war, um, militaries tend to be at least like the United States military, which is the biggest one tend to be like somewhat conservative about like wanting to make sure that the things that they deploy stay under their control. Um, but I think, and that's partially to do with the amount of scrutiny that, that, that they're subject to. But if you think about like cyber warfare and information warfare, I think a lot of that is just like really hard to even, uh, trace and like figure out who's doing what. Um, and there's no, like, there's not such an obvious threat there of like people dying or like things happening in a really direct, obviously attributable, like media firestorm kind of way. But if, if they're like cyber attacks, then you could, you know, take control of news or something like this, right? Yeah, again, like, I don't know what the details are here. But um, the, the point is more like, um, what, I'm, what I'm postulating is like, uh, situations where you have sort of out of control competition between different actors. So they really need to sacrifice a lot of safety in order to like win those competitions to get a system that's capable and strong and performant, whatever you want to say enough that that can like accomplish its goals. And I think when you have that kind of situation, um, at some point, the best way of doing that is going to be to build things that are agentic that look like agents. And, um, you know, they don't have to be like, perfect, uh, you know, homo economicus, rational agents or whatever, like they might be less rational than humans or more rational than humans. But the point is they would be doing, they'd be reasoning about how their actions affect the world um, over a somewhat long time span. And for that reason, they would uh, be prone to coming up with plans that involve like instrumental goal, uh, power seeking behavior, potentially deception, these sorts of things that are the in my mind, part of the, you know, the heart of the concern about um, X risk from, from out of control AI is that uh, the power seeking stuff. So I think one of the main concerns people have with like kind of those scenario is that you would never want to, you know, deploy an agent that can reason over like a month, like all the agents we deploy right now, maybe think for like few time steps for um, maximum like a day, but not like max optimize the strategy for a month and manipulate humans for like longer time or reasons. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. I think most like a day seems long to me, but you know, that's, that's the present we're talking about. But like I'm saying in the future, you know, it's just, you know, once, once you have AI that can do something better than people, um, and 
okay, like I have to caveat what I mean by better and we get into that in a second. But like once you have that, then there's just these massive pressures to replace the people with the AI. Um, so at some point we'll have, I believe, you know, AI that's as smart as people and has the same broad range of capabilities as people, or at least we'll have the ability to build that sort of thing. And then, you know, things that are smarter and can do more things than people. Um, so that means that they'll be able to do long-term thinking and planning better than people. And so then it'll be this question of like, why would we have, you know, a human run this company or like make these plans when we can have an AI do it better? Um, and the better part is like, uh, it might not actually be better, right? So like, it'll be better according to some operation, operationalization of better, which is like, um, probably going to be sort of somewhat, um, driven by like proxy metrics and somewhat driven by like relatively short term thinking. So like on the, on the order of like next quarter rather than like, you know, the coming millennia and all the future generations and all that sort of stuff. Um, so yeah, maximize profits for the quarter, maybe taking some outrageous risk that could end up with your token being devalued yeah, <laughs> too much. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Um, so I, I think most people, when they think about, you know, AGI, they would kind of consider something like a CEO running uh, a company or taking like high level decisions. So like when we reach the level uh, of an AI being able to, you know, replace a CEO or like replace, you know, the decisions of, of a CEO, I think we, we kind of reached the, you know, general level that people care about. So well, yeah, I, I don't really see a world where, you know, you know, can, you can replace the decisions of someone, um, you know, without things already being like very, very crazy. Yeah. I mean, I think, the CEO thing, like not necessarily, right? Like CEOs aren't like fully general necessarily, right? You might say that they are uh, incapable of other, you know, <laughs> other things that so that people need to do. Um, yeah, uh, but I think this question of like, do things get really crazy before? Um, I think, yeah, like probably to some extent, uh, but it's hard to know. So another, yeah, this, this brings me to like another scenario I want to mention for how, how this could happen is like, let's say that, um, things are going relatively well in the like AI governance um, space. And so uh, we have like some, um, you know, norms or, or rules or like the, the practices that people are not just like building, you know, the most agentic systems that they can and like releasing them into the into the wild uh, without any thought of the consequences, the practices like people are doing more like what people have been doing historically and are doing with AI, which is like trying to build relatively well scoped tools and like deploying those and these tools might be like fairly specialized um, in terms of like the sort of data they're trained on the sort of sensors and actuators that they have ac have access to and um, I forget what you asked and how this connects but I'll just keep going on this story <laughs> um, <laughs> Go for it. so so yeah so you could have something that actually is very intelligent in some way um, has a lot of potential to like rapidly learn from new data um, or maybe has like a lot of concepts, uh, a lot of different possible models of how the world could work that it's not able to disambiguate because it hasn't had access to like the data that can disambiguate those. Um, and it's sort of, in some sense, you can say it's like in a box, like it's maybe in the like, you know, text interface box, or maybe it's in the like household robot box and it's never been outside the house and like it doesn't know what's outside the house and these sorts of things. Like an Oracle with like limited data or information about the world. Yeah, like it doesn't have to be an Oracle, but just like some AI system that is like doing something narrow and like really only understands that that domain. Um, and then it can like get out of the box either, you know, because it decides it wants to go out and explore or because, you know, somebody makes a mistake or somebody deliberately like releases it, whatever. Um, so you can suddenly go from it, it didn't really know anything about, you know, anything outside of the domain that it's working in to like, it all of a sudden starts to get a bunch more information about that. And um, then it could become like much more intelligent very quickly for that reason. And so I think people, when they think about this, like FOOM, like fast takeoff scenario, the only like in, in most people's minds, I think this is just synonymous with like recursive self-improvement where you have this AI that like somehow, you know, comes up with some insight or like we, we just put all the pieces together in the right way that it suddenly clicks and it's able to like improve itself really rapidly, at, like mostly at the software level. I think a lot of people find that really implausible because they're like, yeah, I don't think that there are actually algorithms that are like that much better than what we're using maybe, or they just think like, it's really hard to find those algorithms and like, it won't, you know, it'll just be making research progress at roughly the same rate that people are, which is fast, but it's not like, you know, overnight we saw, you know, we go from AGI to super intelligence fast. It's like, you know. Well, I guess like our brains are kind of limited in speed, but if we just have a program that can rewrite its own code, 
and just like optimize overnight it, it it would be like 10 to the 9 faster than humans right yeah i mean like i don't know there's uh <laughs> there's like a lot to say about the recursive self-improvement thing I, I i'm certainly like not trying to dismiss it i'm just saying it's not the only way that you can get fast takeoff so you can also get fast takeoff by you have this thing that was actually really smart already but it was kind of a savant and then it suddenly gains access to a lot more uh information or knowledge or like you know more more sensors and actuators whatever um so in your in your scenario of the like household robot like let's say we have like a i think like tesla humanoid or something like this like yeah. elon Musk's new robot and it suddenly you know opens a door and 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 runs into the street but maybe like everything the designers wanted is just like optimized for the thing being good and the like training data of the of the house right so i don't really see how it will be like good on like the new data outside maybe just like will crash uh, but i can see that like on the internet if you have something maybe some like action transformer that is like train on some normal text data to uh you know fill some forms and then like it, it goes on reddit <laughs> maybe maybe the, the reddit text data will be like the same as the you know the like airbnb uh form data or something yeah um so like it's it's certainly like a kind of speculative thing it's something that i'm trying to you know uh address with my research right now as well is like this question of um yeah will we see uh, this kind of behavior that I'm talking about, where you have sort of like rapid learning or adaptation to radically new environments. Um, and yeah, I mean, I think like one way that I've been thinking about it is this question of like, does GPT-3 or these other, you know, large language models or any sort of like model that's trained offline with, you know, data from limited modalities, is it building a model of the world? How close is it to building a model of the world and like a good one that like actually, you know, includes things like, um, I don't know, like the, the earth is this ball that goes around the sun in the solar system in the galaxy. And like, here's how physics sort of works and just all this stuff, like, you know, like humans definitely have some, some sort of like model of the world that roughly includes things like this. And it sort of all fits together in a, you know, obviously not entirely coherent, but like somewhat coherent way. And it's really unclear if these models have that because we don't really know how to probe the the capabilities or understanding of the models um, in in depth. Some people have tried for like I think Palm like they tried asking like common sense physics questions maybe like just like multi step like two or three steps and it worked pretty well. Well, yeah, I mean I don't know. Um, I I'm like uh, not as up to date on <laughs> all the research and foundation models as I'd like to be, uh, but. I haven't seen anything super impressive in terms of like common sense understanding of of like physical scenarios like i think you know certainly progress is being made but um my my the last i saw it was like they still can struggle to like you know manage a scenario where you describe several objects in a room and those objects being like moved around by people um they get confused by that sort of stuff but all of that is like that is not uh, necessarily revealing the true capabilities or understanding or world modeling ability of the model um, because we don't know how to elicit that stuff right so um the results you get are always sensitive to like how you prompt the model and and things like that and so you can never assume that the model is like trying to do the task that you want it to do um because because like what it's trained to do is just predict text right Right, so you never know actually what the model wants, uh, or, or sorry, what the model knows until you prone it the right way. Well, yeah, I mean, like, I think it's just, it's it's a super hard open question of like, how, like, can we even talk about the model, like having wants or having like understanding and like, what does that mean? Because like, you can also say, well, no, maybe it just has a bunch of like, incoherent and incompatible like beliefs, um, much more so than like a human does. So, like, if you want, you know, humans have this as well, right? But like, we can say humans, as I said earlier, have like something like coherent beliefs about how the, like, what the world looks like, how it works, how it all fits together. Um, and like maybe language models just have nothing at all like that, but maybe they do, or maybe they have, you know, all these incoherent ones, but they have like a large, you know, suite of possible worlds that they're, that they're maintaining a model of and like something like, you know, a posterior distribution of over, or, you know, it doesn't necessarily have to be like this sort of Bayesian thing, but then if they, uh, then get new data that like disambiguates between these models um maybe they can rapidly say like oh yeah i knew that there was one possible model of what the world was like that is basically you know the same model that like you or i would have like with all those all those nice parts um but i just didn't know if that was like the reality that i was in and now all of a sudden it's like very clear that that's the reality the reality i'm in or like at least the reality that i should be like that's the model that i should be using for this context and for for the behavior right now 
so kind of the language model is like living in some quantum physics world and and when he's like observes some something he's like oh yeah i'm in this world now this is what follows yeah um you can like so that there was this um simulator post on um less wrong about how like the language uh, any language model can just like simulate an agent in, inside him yeah so yeah i think in, in some way you can like simulate any agent like some level of complexity um but you don't you're not actually an agent you're just like a simulator yeah then you can imagine that like when like you, you have this model that seems like it's really dumb doesn't understand how to do this physics stuff and like just can't can't like keep track of four different objects in a room but then as soon as you like actually plug it into a robot body and like train it for a little bit on this kind of task it's just like oh oh i get it like you know it, i used to have this massive ambiguity over like what you know what world model i should use to make my predictions or my decisions but like i'm very able to like quickly update and understand the situation i'm in so like there's no actual learning that needs to take place it's just like sort of more like inference on the main crux is um if you could like plug some language model or financial model that has like some very good world model and then you plug it somewhere else maybe it will like understand the world because it can like you know use this uh agent simulation or just like world modeling to interact with the world without having to re learn a new model or something yeah and then you know the where you get into the more like like i think this is something that's a really interesting research question and really important for safety because um yeah people have like very different intuitions about this so i think some people are like have these stories where you know just through this carefully controlled like text interaction like maybe we just ask this uh thing like one yes or no question a day and like that's that's it and like that's the only interaction it has with the world um but it's going to like look at the the floating point errors on the hardware it's built in it's somehow going to become aware of that and from that it's going to like reverse engineer the entire you know outside world and like you know figure out some plan to like trick everybody and get out and like this is the sort of thing that you know people talk about in uh like on, on less wrong and stuff classically and it's you know sort of this um threat model of, like we don't know how smart the super intelligence is going to be so let's just assume it's like you know arbitrarily smart basically and, and obviously a lot of people take issue with that um it's not clear like how how um representative that is of like anybody's actual beliefs but there are definitely people who like have beliefs like more towards that end where they think that like ai systems are going to be able to um understand like a lot about the world even from like a very limited information and like maybe even very limited modality um my intuition is sort of not that not that way i mean i think it's like but yeah i think the important thing is to like test the intuitions and actually try and figure out like at what point uh can your ai system like reverse engineer the world or like at least reverse engineer uh like a, a distribution of worlds or a set of worlds that includes the real world uh, based on like this really limited um kind of data or interaction so you mentioned like your research um i guess people doing research at your lab are trying to like investigate those questions of like how much uh you could like generalize uh from one modality to another uh it, was that basically what you're saying like like you had some papers or some research well on this? i mean yeah it's actually it's not anybody at my lab like the closest thing to i guess yeah no that's not true so there's there's kind of two projects that i think are relevant to what we were just talking about um one is a project that is with somebody not from my lab um ectip and this was about sort of this question of if you have a model that learns the wrong like causal model of the world wrong mechanisms um can you fine tune it to like fix that problem basically <clears throat> and uh you know so so if you train something offline you would often expect that it's not going to learn the right causal model of the world because there's hidden confounders and so um your data just like doesn't actually tell you how the world works it just tells you you know and, and you just pick up on these correlations that aren't actually causal um but then if you like fine tune it with some online data let's say like you let it uh go out and interact with the world so it can actually perform interventions and like see the effects of like you know doing uh those actions or or making those predictions then it might um that might like fix its model and might you know quickly like i was saying sort of lead to having the right model of the world or the right causal model of the world um and what we found in this paper was like if you just do naive fine tuning that doesn't happen um but uh if you do another kind of fine tuning which we propose then you can get that um so so that's like i i i guess i want to make clear that that's not the only reason to look at this question because the way i just described it it sounds like it's just capabilities research um and there's the scientific question right of like does it happen with normal fine tuning but the the method itself uh right now just sounds like oh that's something that's going to like make it easier for these agents to sorry these these models to become like you know 
capable and understand the world rapidly. Um, so the the sort of like reason that a method like that might be useful and good for alignment is that it could help with misgeneralization. So um, kind of this this ability to like understand what is what the right features are or like the right way of viewing the world is probably also critical toward to like getting something that actually understands you know what we want it to do right um so it's very it's very murky which i think is often the case with like thinking about how your research is relevant for uh safety yeah so it, it both like helps the ai better understand the instructions but at the same time it helps it like generalize um Sorry, um, understand causality better and maybe like become more agenty and dangerous. Yeah, yeah. Um, so about causality, um, I remember when one of your talks you said that uh, you tried to feed uh, the book like, um, is it the book of why to a model to see like if it would understand causality and and of course not because you need actual um, you know actions and and outputs or um, input output um, data to like understand causality like or you need to like interact with the world to get causality. I said some stuff sort of like that. <laughs> yeah, so so I talk about the book of why. And the point of doing that is to sort of, I was trying to present these two competing intuitions. And the research that, that I'm interested in doing is like to try and resolve, you know, which of these intuitions is correct or like get a clear picture. Um, so I think, you know, I wouldn't say, of course not. I would say like there's this, you know, print in theory argument for why it shouldn't work. Um, but that that in theory argument doesn't say how badly it will fail. And it doesn't, you know, in general theory, like, doesn't necessarily say much about what's actually going to happen. Um, but I think it is still like a compelling argument and one that most people aren't aware of. So this is from my paper, um, Out of Distribution Generalization via Risk Extrapolation, bit of a mouthful, or Rex is the method. Um, and that's the, the last paper I did during my PhD. Um, With Ethan Kebeler, right? Yeah, yeah, so he's the second author. Um, and uh, yeah, so the we have this remark in the paper that's like basically just saying, oh yeah, by the way, um, you can't expect to learn the correct causal model just from having infinite data and infinitely diverse data, which is like, I kind of get the sense that most people still don't realize that. Like they're just like when you when you talk to people who are like, uh, like Ethan, let's say, who are like the, the scale maximalists, it's like there is this really good argument saying, actually, no, this just isn't going to work. And I'm not saying, you know, the argument is is actually true in practice. I'm just saying, like, it's, it's worth uh, taking seriously. Um, so it turns out that what actually matters is like the actual distribution of the data and not just having like full support and like infinitely much data. Um, and that's because of hidden confounders. What's the full support thing? Oh, full support, I just mean like um, you see every possible input output pair, like every example, you see every possible example infinitely many times. You'd think that you're gonna learn the right thing in that case, right? Like it sort of makes sense intuitively, um, but it's just not true because uh, there are some examples where you see like the same input with you know, the label is zero and the same input with the label is one. And so it actually depends, like, what's the ratio of those two types of examples that you see, right? Um, so, and, and like, you will get different ratios depending on, you know, what kind of data you have. So you're saying, like, if you have, like, infinitely uh, many examples of the right distribution, you won't be able to, like, fit a function to approximate it? No, no, no. If it's the right distribution, then you're good. But my point is, like, uh, the distribution matters, so it's not just the the coverage, but it's the actual distribution. Right. Yeah. Um, so yeah, you mentioned Ethan Cavallero, and um, one thing you mentioned a lot when I was in Morel was training on all of YouTube. So if if your distribution is all of YouTube, can you get some causal model of the world? I mean, that's who knows, right? That's that's kind of the the open question, I think. Like from the paper, risk extrapolation, like is is is. Like, that doesn't address the argument there, no. I mean, like, there's there's always hidden confounders, right? Like, What's a confounder? A hidden confounder is, like, something that affects the relationship between the variables that you observe that you don't observe. So, like, there's always stuff that we don't observe, right? You can only observe a, a tiny, tiny fraction of, like, what's happening at any given moment. And everything is connected. You know, that's just physics, right? So, like, there are just always hidden confounders. Um, so you're just saying, like, there's, like, infinitely many, many variables in the world. So it's impossible to build, like, a true Bayesian model of the world. Yeah, it's it's just it's not uh, necessarily the case that you're going to build the best causal model that you can by just trying to fit your observed data like as well as possible. So you should be thinking about you know these issues of hidden compounders, and you should be trying to model that sort of stuff as well. Do you think people in the deep learning community should like build more causal models? I don't know. I mean, like, I think people should. 
try and understand causality to some extent, have like a basic understanding of causality and should recognize, um, which I think like by and large people in the research community sort of do at this point, that it is a potentially a major issue for applying machine learning in practice. So I think there's a lot of like, you know, hype and over enthusiasm for things that w won't really work in practice. And that partially has to do with um, causality. And I think it's a good, a good angle on like robustness problems. And I think, um, yeah, it's like you can you can do some pretty irresponsible and harmful things if you just like build models and they look like they're working and you haven't thought about like the the potential causal issues there. Well, I guess like the the problem in risk society is like if it works too well, if it works too well, then you have an agent that is very capable and capable of like manipulating you. But if it doesn't work very well, then it's just like you just have a bad bad agent, like not very capable. Well, yeah, I mean, like, I, I, I've, we've sort of been mixing together, like, understanding causality and being an agent, but those are, like, totally separate things and principles. So, like, you can have a good causal model of the world and, like, still just be doing prediction. Like, you don't have to be an agent. Um, so, and that's what, I mean, I think historically people who have been working on, like, causality and machine learning are working on, like, pretty, um, I guess, like, what I want to say, like, like, yeah, prediction more than more than more than agency. Let's put it that way. Um, and and there's also this assumption that, like, yeah, if you're doing, if you are building agents, and you are like historically, people in like reinforcement learning have been thinking about this in like the online context, where the agent gets to learn from interacting with the environment. And there's this recent trend towards offline RL, where instead you learn from data that has already been collected, and that obviously has the same problems like offline learning with supervised learning, where like it's just kind of more clear how causality and causal confusion can be an issue. Um, but yeah, historically, people have been like focused on the online case. And then you just figure, well, okay, the agent's just going to be able to like take interventions and test like, you know, its actions are basically interventions. And so it can actually learn the causal impact of its actions that way. So there's no real issue of causality there. Um, and I guess I'm not sure to what extent that is correct either, because like we have an example in another one of my papers from towards the end of my PhD, hidden incentives for auto-induced distributional shift. Oh yeah, so um, I guess I was just talking about this this paper, uh, and one of the results there was like we're doing online RL using Q learning in a POMDP, and if you set it up right, you can get causal confusion still. Um, so, what's what's causal confusion? Oh, causal confusion. I just mean like the model basically has a, has the wrong causal model of the world, or like is is like gets some stuff backwards, like thinks x causes y when y causes x, or like z causes both x and y. These sorts of mistakes. What kind of POMDP? Was it the the thing with the prisoner dilemma? Or yeah, yeah. So it's a POMDP that's based on the prisoner's dilemma. So it's basically you can think of cooperate and defect as like invest and consume, and so uh, basically if you invest now then you do better on the next time step. But if you consume now, you get more reward now. And so the point of this was just to like, see if uh, if agents are myopic or not. So like, if they consume everything immediately, then they're myopic. And if they invest in their future, then they're non myopic. And uh, this seems like potentially a good way to test for power seeking and instrumental goals, because, you know, instrumental goals are things that you do now so that in the future, you can like get more reward. Um, so it's sort of the delayed gratification is like a important part of that. Is the result that uh, agents today are able to plan and like invest or are they more myopic or it depends on different cases? Oh, yeah. I mean, like this is the, the simplest environment we could come up with to test this. So it's really easy if you build a system that is supposed to be non-myopic, uh, then it will be non-myopic here generally. Um, but the question was, if you build a system that's supposed to be myopic, so if you tell it if you set the discount parameter gamma to zero so that it should only care about the present reward, does it still end up behaving as if it cares about the future reward? So there's sort of the um, another one of these kind of out there uh, speculative concerns is that even if you aren't trying to build an agent, there's some sort of like convergent uh, pressure towards things becoming agents. And so you might be thinking that you're just building like a prediction model, like a supervised learning model that doesn't doesn't think about how its actions affect the world, doesn't care about it, but you know, you'll be surprised that one day it'll like you'll wake up and the next day it's a super intelligent agent that's like taking over the world. And you'll be like, darn, I knew we shouldn't have trusted like GPT five or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, what, what are those kind of pressures? Just like users interacting with it? I mean, I think it's it's super uh speculative to some extent. So I think like maybe traditionally I think this has been motivated from the point of view of like what 
are yeah i don't know so like basically like people talk about like decision theories and stuff like this um and i think i'm gonna kind of butcher this <laughs> but um i i guess I want to say like there's this view from you know people like Eliezer and Miri and Lestrong that um, you can't build something that is AGI in the sense of like that like how I would define it like human like and human level intelligence uh, unless it is an agent and um, so if you if you wake up one day and found that you have built AGI it means that you know however you built it. Uh, you produced an agent. So like, even if you were just doing prediction, like somehow that thing turned into an agent. And then the question is like, how could that happen? Why could that happen? Um, and it gets, it gets pretty like, pretty weird. But I mean, I guess you can say, um, if you really believe that like agency is sort of the, the best you know, way to do stuff is to like be an agent, then um, maybe the best way to like solve any task is to be an agent. Um, even if it looks like it's just a prediction task. I mean, I think... What yeah, is, like, I, being an agent? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I feel like I'm, I'm really uh, butchering this right now. Um, <laughs> being an agent is, you know, it means a bunch of different things to different people. In this context, it's uh, sort of the, the term of art in the uh, online, you know, existential safety, Miri, less strong alignment form community would be, like, consequentialist, um, which is a term barred from philosophy. But basically, it means that like I sort of alluded to earlier, you're thinking about how your actions will affect the world um, and planning for the future. But it's even a little bit more than that because uh, in like the limit, it means you sort of have, um, I don't know, are like as rational as possible. And maybe that includes doing things like a causal trade and like these weird decision theories that say you shouldn't just think about the causal effects of your actions. You should act as if you're deciding for every every um, every system agent algorithm whatever in your reference class this is something i've never understood like a causal trade mm. so if you if you have a good like two minutes explanation that would be awesome i mean i i don't think i'm like the right person but again i, I let's just go for it um, so i guess uh maybe the simplest version of this actually is just um yeah okay i i can explain it with reference to my my research and then we can say like how it might generalize and sure so so in my case it's like um, this prisoner slum environment. So um, if you reason as if you are deciding for every copy of yourself, including like the copy on the last time step. Yeah, and I was, I was saying like in this uh, POMDP inspired by the prisoner dilemma in this work that we we're talking about, um, if you think about yourself as deciding for all the agents in your reference class that might include like the version of you on the previous time step and then you might say well if i cooperate then it probably means i cooperated on the last time step which means i'll probably get the payoffs of like cooperate cooperate um and if i defect i probably just defected so i'll get like defect defect and cooperate cooperate is better than defect defect so maybe i should cooperate whereas um you know normally the the sort of uh more obvious way of thinking about this so is to say look, whatever I did is already done. So I'm just going to defect because that helps me right now. Um, and, and these roughly map on to like the first one, evidential decision theory and the second one, causal decision theory. Um, and, you know, the, the sort of uh, a causal trade falls out of these decision theories, like uh, functional decision theory, which sometimes act more like EDT and sometimes act more like CDT. And you can <laughs> you can now say, okay, so that's uh, that's what I would do in this case. And then you can say, like, well, what about like agents and other like parts of the multiverse or something who are like me? And like maybe if I, maybe I want to like cooperate with those you know agents that exist in some other universe. And that's that's the the part that I think I'm not going to do a good job of explaining. So let's just say like you know by analogy, cooperating with your past self is sort of like cooperating with a copy of yourself in, in another universe or something. So why would you cooperate with your past self? Um, you would, so I guess actually, yeah, it's not really cooperating with your past self here. It's cooperating with like your past and your future self in a way, because like your past self isn't the one who gets the benefits of you cooperating. It's your future self who gets the benefits of you cooperating or investing. Um, so it's kind of like committing to a strategy of a ways investing or, or cooperating so that all the copies of yourself um, do the right thing. Yeah, but it's it's like, you know, the way that you put it makes it sound like I'm going to commit to doing this from now on so that in the future I can benefit from it. So are the agents um, 
trying to maximize reward over time uh, or maximize uh, their decisions over time. Um, like you were talking about some gamma that was set to zero. Is the kind of gamma you have in RL where it can be like 0 0.9 or 1, and the more it gets close to 1, the more it like optimizes over the long term? Yep. And so in the case of something um, cooperating with its past self or future self, is like gamma closer to 1 or non-zero? So like all the experiments in this paper, we had gamma 0. And even with gamma 0, it tried to cooperate? Well, it did, it did you know, quote unquote cooperate, right? There's two actions, and it took the one that uh corresponds to cooperating in the prisoner's dilemma in some settings because it like maximizes reward for one step or yeah it's it's like kind of complicated to get into that because like the question of like what counts as maximizing reward is like kind of depends on your decision theory and stuff like this um so like at any point if you defect you will get more reward than if you cooperate like from a causal point of view um but yeah, uh, cooperate, cooperate is better than defect, defect. And for some algorithms, um, you end up seeing mostly defect, defect or cooperate, cooperate payoffs. And like cooperating ends up being really good evidence that you cooperated on the last time step. So like good evidence that you'll get the cooperate, cooperate payoffs and vice versa for a defect. So it kind of depends on, you know, if you're doing causal or evidential reasoning. That yeah, yeah I, I I wouldn't go deep into all the decision theories because yeah. I haven't I haven't read um all of them. Um, do you remember what why we were talking about agents? Uh, we were talking earlier about this argument about the book of why, and I said like, there's this argument from my paper on risk extrapolation, saying, you know, uh, if you train your foundation model offline, it's probably going to be causally confused, um, and I think that's like a good argument, but I don't think it's conclusive. And I think there's like good counter arguments. Um, so like the one that I focus on is basically if your language model reads the book of Y and other text on causality and is able to like do a good job of predicting that text, then it seems like it must have some understanding of the content of the text. So it must understand causality in some sense. So this kind of comes back to this question we were talking about of like, is the model going to build a good model of the world? um that is like accurate so in this case uh you might say well it kind of needs th this is sort of the argument for why just training on text means that you need to learn a lot of things about how the world actually works is because a lot of the text that you're going to predict is like the best way to predict that is to have a good model of the world maybe um <clears throat> yeah and so then that's an argument for saying actually it is going to understand causality and i think it's like pretty unclear how this all shakes out um and it's really interesting to look at it uh, and so we have another another project that's sort of about that, saying, you know, um, there's this there's this question of like, if it understands it, is it then going to actually like use it to reason about things? So it could like have this understanding of causality or physics or like what the actual you know world that we live in looks like, and like sort of have that in a little box over here that it only it only ever uses that box when it's in a context that is like very specifically about that. So like it only ever you know, taps into the fact that like the earth is a third planet from the sun when like people are asking questions about that sort of thing, like about the solar system. And otherwise it's like not paying any attention to that, um, that part of its you know model or, or, or whatever. Um, but you might say like, actually, um, it should be possible for the model to recognize which types of information or maybe which types of sources provide good, very general information that is about things like how the world works and to try and sort of use that even outside of those contexts. Um, so that's kind of the, the question here is like, if, if you assume that the, the model is going to learn these sorts of things, is it actually going to reason with them like across the board or is it only going to like tap into them in like very particular context? So like, is it going to reason causally um, even when it's not looking at text about causality or is it only going to tap into that understanding when it's like predicting text in like the book of why. So the question is, uh, will the model only understand causality when we feed it some causal text? Not will it only understand it, but will it only like leverage that understanding or like, you know, be using that that part of its uh, of its model. So if we don't prompt it with like some book of why, it will not be able to, you know, use the like part of his model that is about causality. 
yeah or i guess I, I would put it more like it will choose not to but um yeah it's you know ability versus um motivation is like something that we don't really know how to disentangle rigorously in these models um yeah and then like just one other thing i want to mention is like you know i i think this is a you know um this is just one way that you can get these models to like even if you even if the models don't like do the causally rights like appropriate stuff by themselves um it doesn't mean that we can't like like that this is a fundamental barrier like in some sense it is so i think i tend to agree with like a lot of the criticisms that m people make of like just scaling up deep learning and like the limitations of it and i'm like yeah those are limitations but like they kind of don't matter that much because we can get around them so like if your model uh can do causally correct reasoning when prompted in the right way then like you just have to figure out how to get it to like you know to to do that reasoning at the right time and i think that's like not that hard of a problem a lot of time probably and like similarly things about like the model doesn't have long-term memory or like you know it's uh i don't know what what just uh, all the other limitations that people have like uh, yeah systematic generalization like it can't um you know learn really robustly like logical stuff and like do deduction and stuff like that well it's like we have you know other ways of doing that sort of things like we have you know it, existing frameworks and algorithms for like doing deduction and like doing reasoning and like i think you know all, all the model needs to do is like learn how to interact with those things or we can learn like another system that sort of puts all these pieces together and that's what i think is like actually the most likely path to agi is not just like scaling but sort of somehow cobbling together um all these different pieces in the right way and that might be done that might be done, you know, using machine learning. So that might not be something that people do. That might be something that we, in the end, we just like do a big search over all the different ways of combining all the ideas that we've come up with in AI and like the search sort of stumbles across the right thing. And then, you know, you might very suddenly have something that is actually, you know, has these sort of broad capabilities. Um, so we do some, some sort of like neural architecture search, but with like different models that could like interface with each other. And at the end, we get something that like, like there's like one causal model, one language model was one like Asian and they all like piece together to like, I don't know, use their superpowers or something together. Yeah, like that's that's roughly the, the right picture. I mean, I think like neural architecture search is a pretty specific technique, but it's like that sort of thing, like meta learning, neural architecture search, automatic hyperparameter tuning are like examples of things that are like this. Um, but I think they're all like fairly narrow and weak compared to like the sort of things that machine learning researchers and engineers do. So um, if we can automate that even in a way that like maybe isn't as good as people, but is like reasonably like good, at least it like is better than just sort of random search. And then we can do it, um, you know, faster than people can, then that could lead to uh, something that looks sort of like recursive self-improvement, but um, probably still not like overnight. Um. Is there like any evidence for that? Because I feel like trend in the past few years have been to just like have foundational foundational models that are you know larger that can use different model ideas or something and not like gluing together different models or like searching over the space of like how to interact how to interface two different models so have, have you seen like any paper or research on that direction so i guess one thing i would say is like a lot of the a lot of this stuff like like planning um is being done you know with foundation models these days and it's working quite well uh, but it's not just like, you know, we're, we're using, like, still, we're, we're sort of explicitly inducing that planning behavior somehow. Um, so uh, we're building, like, an architecture or, like, we're, we're running the model in a way that, like, you know, looks like planning. Um, so we're not just, like, sort of doing it purely end-to-end. -end. We're, like, prompting it to make plans or we're building architectures that involve planning um, sort of at the architectural level, or we're doing things like Monte Carlo tree search or some other sort of like test time, you know, algorithm that combines multiple predictions from the model in some sort of clever way. Um, I think, uh, yeah, what I'm saying, I think does sort of go against current trends. And so I think in that, from that point of view, um, there's like maybe some, uh, validity to critics who are like, oh, people are focusing too much on scaling uh, from my point of view, from, you know, from the point of view of just like making AGI as fast as possible, which is not really what I think the goal should be, obviously. Um, <clears throat> you do also see um, people using foundation models to do things like, um, like meta learning, basically, like, so 
training a foundation model to take as input a data set and output like a, predict a predictor on that data set. So, um, wait, it just like outputs a model or mm. in some ways? I'm not sure if it outputs a model or if you take a data set and a new input that you want to make a prediction on, and then you produce the output for that particular input. So it's kind of simulating another model. So basically trying to do all of the like learning in a single forward pass, which is also an idea that like Rich Turner, one of my colleagues at CBL, um, has, has been doing for, for years, but not with foundation models, but um, using uh, neural processes as the, the line of work. And excuse me. Um, yeah, so I think I think there is like an ongoing, you know, effort to automate machine learning research and engineering. Um, and it still hasn't paid off in a big way yet, but I think it's sort of bound to at some point because everything's going to pay off at some point because AGI. <laughs> so like, yeah, are you like on the side of like the bitter lesson or like any like engineering trick or, um, small formula will like end up being irrelevant with scale? I don't think that's quite like what the, maybe it's more, about meta says, yeah. it's more about meta learning and, um, then, uh, actually just scaling. Like, I guess like at least it's more like in RL, um, the methods that, um, you know, scale with computer data or, um, the meta learning approaches are better than just like, you know, engin <laughs> engineered ones, right? Yeah. I don't, I don't feel like the bitter lesson is being about meta learning at all. Um, but it's just about like, you know, I think, uh, learning, um, so I think learning, planning, search, two of those three, I think it's learning and, and search are, are the ones that he focuses on. Um, as being, you know, the sort of the things that scale. And I think this is true, basically. And I think it's, uh, it's one of the reasons in my mind to be worried about existential safety is because I think, um, yeah, we like whether or not, uh, just scaling up deep learning leads to AGI, there's definitely like large returns to just scaling up compute and data. Um, and, but that doesn't really deal with the alignment problem per se, like it might end up in some way, but, um, you know, I think as these things, th this is an argument that I'm trying to flesh out right now. Um, and I think it might just be kind of wrong or misguided in some sense, but intuitively it seems right to me. Um, and the argument is, um, as you get like more and more complex systems, it becomes harder and harder to like understand and control them. Um, just because they're complicated and, uh, there's like more different things that they could do. And so you need to like provide more bits to like disambiguate between all the many things that they could do to get the things that you actually want them to do. Um, and you know, they're just like more complex. So it takes more labor to like understand them if you want to like really understand all the details. So the, the more complex a model is, um, the more like work a human, uh, who need to like actually disambiguate if the model is aligned or not. If there's like one aligned uh, model among like two to the power of like 10, uh, you would need like more time or like more feedback or more interpretability tools. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's sort of the claim, which I think, you know, empirically it looks like this is just maybe wrong. Like it's kind of unclear because, you know, people have found that as you scale up models, they, uh, maybe get like easier to align in some sense. Like it seems like they sort of understand better, like what, what we're asking for and stuff like this. Um, so I think that's, that's the part that I'm currently stuck on is like how to deal with, I think, cause I think right now a lot of people won't find this convincing, even though like my intuition still says like, no, there's something to this argument. Um, yeah, another way of putting it, I think, which also will certainly not land for everybody, but is in terms of this distinction between like descriptive and normative, uh, information or, or like, um, facts. So basically I think the bitter lesson applies to like descriptive things. So basically facts about how the world is, but it doesn't apply to like normative things, which is like what is good or what we want. So like learning and, and search and like scaling, you know, don't really address that part of how do we get, uh, how do we get all the information in the system about what we want? So scale is not all you need when you need to do alignment. Yeah. 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 Uh, and like, you know, I think, you know, another part of the argument is like, um, maybe it is, but like, we won't really know, 
Uh, so like you can just sort of hope that something works and just like go for it. Um, but I think what we should be aiming for is like actually understanding and like not taking that kind of gamble. So I think a lot of the, um, yeah, what to say here? Like, yeah, there's, there's this distinction between like a system being existentially safe and us knowing that that's the case and having like justified confidence in it. So not just like thinking it's the case or like having, you know, having convinced ourselves, but actually having like a sound reason for believing that. So e e even if it would be like, um, existentially safe in like 90% of the cases, um, we would need some kind of strong reason to believe that and uh, be sure before running it. And um, even e even if um, there's like a high chance of it being like safe, we, we we wouldn't have the tools to like be sure it's safe. Yeah, so I, I would put it more like, let's say there's a fact of the matter, which is like, if you run this system, it's either gonna take over the world and kill everyone or not. And like, that's, you know, that's like pretty much deterministic, um, but you don't know which of those outcomes is gonna occur. And you might say like, I have essentially no reason to believe that that's what's going to happen, except for some sort of, you know, general concern and paranoia about uh, systems that seem really smart being like potentially dangerous. And, you know, from the point of view of existential safety, when we're talking about potentially, you know, wiping out all of humanity, it seems like the bar should be really high in terms of the amount of confidence you would like us to have before we turn on a system that like we have some reason to believe could destroy humanity. How high? Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't know, like... Uh, how many nines? Yeah, that's that's a good question. I guess it depends on, like, how long-termist you are or something. But, like, you know, I think we can sort of say, you know, definitely a lot because, you know, it, it it's at the amount of harm that we're talking about is, like, at least killing everyone alive right now. And then if you value future people to some extent, then that starts to grow more. So we've been like bouncing around this like notion of like alignment or um, yeah, having models do what we want. Like, do you have like any more precise definition? Because I I've tried to talk to, pe to Mila people about it and um, it, it, it seemed like <laughs> even if you were there for like a few years, people didn't know exactly what alignment was. Yeah, I mean, I, I was there for almost 10 years and the lab grew a ton from, you know, from something like 50 people to something like a thousand over the course of time when I was there. How was the, what was the difference between like 50 to 1,000. I mean, it's, it's totally different, yeah. Uh, and and then the, the last couple of years was like during the pandemic. So I was already sort of starting to like lose touch, I would say. Also, when we moved to our new building, I think like people weren't coming into the lab as much. Um, and it was uh, sort of, you know, changed the culture in various ways. Um, How was the beginning, like the, the when you were like only 50 people? Um, I mean, yeah, it was... It was cool. I don't know. Uh, like, can you, more specific question, please. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, would you like cooperate or like collaborate with like mostly like everyone and like know what everyone was doing? Not per se, but yeah, definitely more like that. I guess at the beginning, I would say it was much more like sort of uh, Joshua's group and like everyone, like he was sort of like you know the leading the vision for the for the group to a large extent, and like everyone was doing deep learning, and deep learning was like this small niche fringe thing. So it was still like, you could sort of be up to date on all of the deep learning papers, which is like just laughable now. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think like 10 years ago, um, there was this story of Ian Goodfellow being like reading all the deep learning papers in archive. Yeah. Um, so yeah, this was 2012, right? So it was after AlexNet? Yeah, yeah. So like um, AlexNet and Ilya Sutskever's text generating RNN are like the things that sort of got me into the field. So I was watching these uh, Jeff Hinton Coursera lectures and he showed those things. And this was like the first thing that I saw that looked like it had the potential to, you know, scale to AGI in some sense. Um, and so I was already like basically convinced when I saw those that like this was going to be a big deal and I wanted to get involved. And so then I applied like in 2012 for grad school and started in 2013. But you needed to like be at least like in the field of AI to kind of see those signals, right? Because most people came maybe like in 2015 or 2016, like um, well, I mean, I wasn't in the field of AI. So, like, <laughs> as someone outside, how, how did you like saw it as like very important? Or, like, I mean, so uh, I studied math and like knew like was trying to get a lot of different perspectives on basically intelligence and like society and social organization and these sorts of things during during my studies before that. And 
I was always interested in AI, um, but it looked like, you know, I like when I started college, I didn't even know it was like a, a, a field of research. Um, so I was like definitely like learning uh, uh, pretty slowly, like what what it was and what was out there. And I think I heard about machine learning, you know, when I was like in my second or third year of college. And then I like went and looked at maybe something. I don't know if it was like Andrew Ng's machine learning course, or, but it was something that resembled that. And, you know, there you see like linear regression, logistic regression, kernel methods, um, nearest neighbors. I was just like, well, this is crap. <laughs> I mean, like, this is just not going to scale to AI. Like, maybe, maybe in like over 100 years, like if you just scale these things up with like, you know, orders and orders of magnitude more compute. Um, but it just seemed clearly like not anything you should be calling AI. Um, and so, and then I also heard about deep learning and, uh, yeah, I guess neural networks, like artificial neural networks, um, in between my second and third year when I was doing research in computational neuroscience. And so like somebody, you know, drew a neural network and was like, and like you train this with gradient descent based on like, you know, the error signal. And I was like, wow, that is like so cool. This, this like looks really, this is like the right level of abstraction for people to like try and understand and solve intelligence. Cause like the other stuff there was like modeling individual neurons at like the level of physics and stuff like this. And it's just like, this is never also not going to go anywhere anytime soon. Um, so you just thought like the abstraction was good and you had some like basic understanding of linear regression. So you saw the like Alexander paper and you were like, oh, this thing actually scales with more layers. Yeah. So, so I also like, when I saw that I was really excited by it, but they said like, this doesn't work. And like, it's sort of like been disproven as like an approach and I was like sad. And so then I was like, oh, there's this course on neural networks on Coursera. And there were like 10 different courses that I had like, you know, followed or whatever, but hadn't really watched anything. And I just decided to binge watch that one sort of on a whim. And I was like, holy shit, like, you know, they lied to me. <laughs> it, <laughs> it does work. And so it was both like I had this intuition already that like this was a promising approach to to solving AI, and then just seeing, you know, the the text generation was like sort of artificial creativity of some of some sort, um, and then seeing that it could deal with you know what's clearly like a complex thing, which is like uh, vision, and was you know just sort of almost out of the box, like doing just a, a huge step improvement over like you were sort of seeing these other you know methods leveling off, and then it was just like zoom. Um, and so I was like, yeah, you know, and, and I think Jeff Henson made a bunch of good arguments as well in his lectures sort of about the scalability of the methods and about things like cursive dimensionality and sort of just like, so from first principles, why you need to be doing deep learning or something like it somewhere in your AI system. Um, yeah. And so fast forward a little bit, um, you go to Mila, you spend 10 years there and nobody, nobody knows about Lime. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, it's, it's a little bit puzzling to me, I guess. I've definitely, um, was like in the early days I was running, you know, I was talking to everybody who I could to some extent about this. I mean, so for the first couple of years I was, I was kind of expecting that I would get to Mila and like everyone would be like, oh yeah, we know about that stuff. And like, you don't have to worry about it because XYZ have like really good reasons. And turns out, you know, people didn't know about it. Um, so then. I sort of, you know, started trying to talk to people about it a lot, but I was still like, you know, I was, I was kind of like an outsider, hadn't, hadn't really done programming before and stuff when I, when I got there. So I, and like, I was really, uh, felt like a little bit intimidated and just like impressed by, by the people there. Um, and I didn't really have much of a cohort when I started as well. Like there were a couple, two other guys starting at the same time as me, but they were doing like industrial masters. Um, so I think it took me a little while to like gain the confidence to just like, you know, sort of be really outspoken, uh, about this, um. But by the end of my master's and beginning of my PhD, I was like, yeah, this is what I want to do. And like, I'm going to try and, you know, talk to people about it and influence people. And when did you learn about alignment? I'm not sure. Um, oh, yeah. Something I wanted to say earlier is like, we're talking about alignment, but uh, I want to distinguish it from like existential safety. So I think like alignment is a technical research area that may or may not be helpful for AI existential safety. And it's about like, in my mind, getting the systems to like have the right intention or like understand what you what it is that you want them to do. Um, yeah. So like existential safety is the thing that I think I'm mostly like, uh, I'm like focused on and like to talk about, um, in, in this context, I think like they, they sort of get interchanged a lot, but so I learned about it, um, before I started grad school, but I'm not sure how long before. Um, and you know, my perspective before, uh, like realizing that AI might, AGI might like happen in my lifetime was basically, um, maybe this will be a concern, you know, when AGI actually happens in the distant future. But in the meanwhile, everything is going to get really weird and, and probably really fucked up because uh, we're just going to have like better and better automated systems of like, you know, um, monitoring 
and controlling people basically um and that's going to be those are going to be deployed probably like in the interest of power and or like in in maybe something more like a best case they're going to just sort of fall victim to bad social dynamics where um yeah we it's it's like still just not really optimizing for what we care about do you, do you still like um agree with that view uh, like oh, a, yeah. a slower takeoff scenario well i mean i i don't know about like the slow takeoff or hard takeoff thing i think they're both like quite plausible um but the the view that like if even if we didn't have agi we would still have a lot of like major issues from advancing narrow ai systems i think that still seems right to me i mean i think it's hard to know but um yeah. but, like in in our trajectory like where we are right now yeah. um do you think we will see like arm from narrow systems uh for like multiple years before we get to agi like in the or or we will only get to those like kind of very um negative arms um when we're like very close to agi that's the the question is like is it like a period of like three or five years uh, of like society going uh, crazy and uh, ai systems um like being like an align causing like harm or is it like just before the end like before crunch time um i mean i think things are already going crazy and like have been for a while so i think like the way that the the world works and is set up it it doesn't make sense it's nuts um and like y you look at like just the way that like money works and there's just all of this like money being created you know by financial instruments that is pretty detached from like the fundamentals of the economy um and i think yeah you look at the way that like um i don't know like our collective epistemics work and a lot of people are just like very badly misinformed about a lot of things um and there's a lot of structural incentives to like you know provide people some combination of like the information that is most like you know grabs their attention the most and also is like helpful to people with a lot of power and that's kind of how how you know the information uh, economy works to the most for the most part so so you're saying basically um is not very balanced in terms of how the money is created how it's like um spread over our economy and information is always, um, also like fed to people's brains in a way that like hacks their word system and um controls them or manipulates them and like maybe like ai will like exacerbate both the like power imbalance or uh, money imbalance yeah it will and it already and it already has been is the other thing so like i mean um i think and and it's not just ai it's sort of like uh development of like technology that is useful for like understanding humans and predicting them in general so like you know marketing as a thing is like kind of a recent invention and it's kind of based to some extent i think on us having a better understanding of how to manipulate people and then having the technology to do that at scale for cheap um is your research like focused on like solving those like shorter like current problems or more like uh, existential safety so to like to be clear existential safety is when we run a system run a, um like when we press play or something the system takes over the world whatever um you said before no <laughs> <laughs> yeah so existential safety I, i think is like much broader than that so i think um i i like totally reject this dichotomy between like the sort of existential safety of like the fast takeoff the thing takes over the world immediately and this sort of slow takeoff of like things get uh less and less aligned with like human values and we're more and more like sort of i don't know manipulated and uh optimizing at a societal level for the wrong things like just you know increasing gdp even though we're destroying the planet like just kind of dumb <laughs> because like one caused the other like one can like make the other more much more likely like if 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 humanity is like um going in the wrong direction then well i mean yeah so that's part of it right is is that that can lead to a situation where we're like ultimately we lose control in the sense that no um set of human beings even if they were in some sense like perfectly coordinated could change the course of the future so that's like one sense of loss of control that's like the strongest sense where it's just like even if everyone all got together and was like let's just stop using technology like destroy the computers like unplug the internet everything 
it would be like too late and like the AI like has its own you know factories or like ab ability to persist in the physical world um even you know given our best effort attempts to like destroy it um that's the, like the strongest version but there's also a version of like out of control AI which is just like you know out of control like um I don't know, like climate change, right? Where it's like, yeah, in some sense, we could all coordinate and like stop this, but we're not doing it. We probably aren't going to do it uh, to the extent that we should. And like, there's no one person or small group of people who have the power to do this. It's like, would take um, a huge amount of coordination that we don't really have the the tools to, to, uh... okay, now, okay, I probably have to walk this back because I don't know enough about it. And like, to some extent, it probably is like something where it's just, um, I'm not sure we need like fundamentally new coordination tools to solve climate change. We might just need like a lot more moral resolve on the part of like people with power or something. But I think there's definitely a lot of gnarly coordination problems that are like contributing in a massive way to climate change. So is there like any way to solve those coordination problem? Like isn't like it basically intractable compared to other, you know, technical problems in AI? Um, no, I don't think so. I mean, I think, um, we know that there are like you know, voting systems that seem a lot better than the ones that we use, like in the United States anyways, um, and I think are still really popular. Like people call it first past the post, which is a terrible name because it's actually whoever gets the plur plurality wins. So the post isn't even like at some fixed point, but just majority, you know, majority rule, um, actually plurality rule, right? <laughs> majority rule is also a bad name. Um, and so things like approval voting um, seem to just be like basically robustly better for for most contexts. And of course, there are like these impossibility results that say, oh, no voting s system is perfect. But you talk to people who actually study this stuff and like, it seems like pretty much everyone likes approval voting and would just like sign off on using it everywhere that we're using um, whatever you should call this thing, majority rule, first past the post, uh, plurality rule, let's call it that because that's what it is. And yeah, so that's like just one simple example. Um, I think there's a lot of like low hanging fruit for doing more coordination, um, both at just kind of the like level of people talking to each other more and like trying to understand each other and like be more cooperative. So um, I think, you know, let's say like internationally, it seems like uh, there's kind of surprisingly little in the way of like connections between um, like, yeah, China and like the West, like I think you have a, a massive imbalance where like a lot of people in China come to the West to 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 study and to have a career and a lot of people there like learn to speak English and you don't really see the opposite. So there's like very little, I would say like understanding or even like ability to understand like what's going on in China and like what, you know, what the people are like there, what the system is like there from people in the West. Um, so Americans uh, are not trying to understand Chinese and is like kind of a, a one-sided relationship. Yeah, to a large extent. Yeah. And like that's... You know why is that happening i mean i guess it's sort of like for historic and power reasons where it's like english is sort of like this lingua franca that it just makes sense for people to to learn whereas like you know i think it would make sense from from a lot of point of view including like individuals and maybe like the u.s national interest for more people to learn chinese but it's difficult and there's not like this obvious pressing need um because like stuff gets translated into english but i think yeah so that's just one example um then also like at the level of, uh, I think we have coordination mechanisms um, that could be scaled up. So basically assurance contracts, which are things like Kickstarter, um, where you say like, if like, I will agree to do this, like, let's say I will agree to like boycott this company um, for their unethical practices, assuming enough other people agree to do it. And until we have enough people, we just won't do the boycott. And that's uh, an assurance contract. And so if you can like monitor and enforce those contracts, um, then you can solve a lot of collective action problems because there's essentially no cost uh, to signing up for one of these, especially if you can do it in a sort of non-public way so you can't be pu punished in advance for taking that political stance. And then once you have enough people who are like on board with taking that action, then you actually take it. And that's that's why you need like the monitoring enforcement part to like make sure that people actually do follow through on their, on their commitments. But I think there's like tons of low-hanging fruit in that area. So some kind of like centralized system where people can just like just pre-commit to some action if um, millions of people are boycotting McDonald's or... Yeah, like it doesn't have to be centralized. It can be decentralized. Um, and this is something that I've like sort of been thinking about for a long time and sort of hesitant to talk about because I think it also could pose existential risks. Because I think like at the end of the day, it's not just a problem of coordination. Like it's also like uh, coordinating, you know, in the right way or for the right things or something. So, you know, if you think about like 
in Antive is very well coordinated, but we probably don't want to live in a future where we're all like basically part of some hive mind. I mean, I don't know, hard to hard to like say definitive things about that, but like I'm sure a lot of people right now would like look on that future with a, a lot of suspicion or disgust or um, displeasure. Um, so we shouldn't, we should try and avoid a situation where we just kind of like end up in that kind of future without uh, realizing it or or unintentionally or something. Um, I think like better coordination without uh, thoughtfulness about how it's how it's working could potentially lead to that. Are you basically saying that we need to do like enough coordination to not build and save AGI, but not too much because otherwise we'll end up like being like just like one mind and like some people might prefer to be like individuals and not like one giga brain. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the second possible failure mode is like really speculative and weird and I don't know how to think about it. I just think it's something that we should at least be aware of. But yeah, we I think uh, we we definitely need to do enough coordination to like not build uh, AI that could take over the world and kill everybody if uh, if that looks like it's you know a real possibility, which in in my opinion like yes, that's that's something we should <laughs> we should figure out and worry about. Yeah, I think some people in the like open source community just have this different scenario done from people like in the let's say more safety community, where people in the safety community will like think of like one agent. Um, being like vastly uh, smarter than other agents, and this agent might, you know, get a strategic advantage or like, like you know, transform the herd into like some um, giant computer or something. Whereas like people in the open source community might think that um, we might get like different agents, like mul multiple scenarios, um, where if you open source everything, then maybe like we get like different levels and they would like kind of balance each other out. Um, so yeah, when we were talking about like hive mind or something, I, I was kind of thinking of like, so yeah, do, do you believe we're going to get like a bunch of like different AIs kind of balancing each other or like one agent uh, smarter than the others? I don't have like a super strong intuition about this. I think the, the agents balancing each other out thing is like, um, not, you know, it's, it's not necessarily better from an existential safety point of view. Um, and I guess there's also these arguments that I find like fairly compelling, although not decisive, um, saying if you have highly advanced AI systems, they should be able to solve coordination problems amongst themselves. So even if you start out with multiple agents, like they might, you know, form a hive mind basically because they can solve these coordination problems that humans haven't been able to solve as effectively. And like, so one reason why it might be easier for AI systems to coordinate is because, um, they might be able to just like look at each other's source code and you know you have to like ensure that you're actually looking at the real code and they aren't showing you fake code and stuff like this but um it seems plausible that like we could end up in a situation where they can all see each other's source code and then you can like basically say is this you know somebody who is going to cooperate with me if i cooperate with them and you can yeah so yeah like one scenario i have in my mind is just like if we deploy a bunch of those you know ac action transformers from adapt that you know can like do requests on the web and uh i know they kind of understand that the other person like that they're interacting with is like an ai as well and so you can have like those like millions of of agents kind of running into this equilibrium at the same time is this basically what you're saying you get those things that like kind of identify each other through requests and um like communicate to each other um um that sounds like I, I haven't quite i'm not sure i've understood but it sounds like a, a more specific version of what i'm saying basically yeah yeah um i think um a lot of um the people uh that asked me questions on twitter were kind of um more interested in like kind of your uh research agenda for solving essential safety and not like um like other takes you might have and um one thing that's kind of very specific uh, about yourself is that you don't have a specific agenda, but you have a bunch of like BSU students uh, doing a bunch of different things. And that's one thing. The other thing is uh, you often say that you're like more of a, a breaker than a, a maker. You prefer to like break systems than uh, build like system. Like, <laughs> okay, I, I, I maybe like misrepresenting your view, but yeah, can you explain a bit more what you say about? Yeah, totally. Um, so yeah, I've been thinking about this stuff for a long time, like more than 10 years now. And uh, it's always seemed like a really hard problem, and I don't see any super promising paths towards solving it. Like, I think there are sort of these Hail Mary things where it's like, oh, yeah, maybe this will work, and, like, it makes sense to to try, probably. But um, for all of those, it's like none of them, I think, are anywhere close to addressing this, like, justified confidence issue that we talked about. So at the end of the day, 
these research programs are like mostly about um like the yeah the ones that are like look like they might have a chance of working like in the near term um are mostly about like just you know let's just like cross our fingers and just hope that the thing is aligned you know we'll train it to to do what we want and like hopefully it does um and yeah, so so I'm not very optimistic about those approaches. I mean, I think, like I said, you know, maybe maybe it works, but I'm more interested in like providing uh, strong evidence or like reasons and arguments for like why these approaches aren't going to work. And so, like, my intuition is like, yeah, it's probably not going to work. Um, probably things are going to go wrong for some reason or another. It seems like there's a lot of things that I'll have to go right in order for you know for this to to work out. Um, yeah, so that's like the make or breaker thing that you're talking about. And this is kind of like a recent way that I've thought about framing like my my research and what I'm doing. Um, so I'm kind of in the process of maybe trying to develop more of like an agenda. I've historically been like kind of um, a little bit like, I don't know, anti-agenda or skeptical of agendas or like the way that people talk about it right now in like the sort of rationalist or community or something like this, uh, the online you know non non-academic uh existential safety community just like seems kind of weird it seems very like um yeah like playing into some some dysfunctional dynamics of like people who don't really understand stuff well enough so they defer a bunch to other people and the people who they defer to are like sort of you know just like it seems like a lot of it is sort of like social and trendy and very like caught up in like whatever's going on in the bay and <laughs> um and of course then there's also like influence from tons of like billionaire like money i mean maybe not anymore uh, in the same way but you know there's there's a lot of and so i think you know the the sort of epistemics of the community get distorted by all of these things and then you have people like doing this stuff where, where like there's some things where it ends up being looking a little bit like um these sort of social science fields where it's like more like about cult of personality and like who who's hot and who knows who and who like and you're like trying to interpret like oh like did paul mean this by this or did he mean that and like you have you know these debates that aren't, aren't really about the object level question but are about like yeah and and then i think yeah i can i can like go on and on about um <laughs> like the 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 gripes that i have with these commu these communities or this community um and to some extent it's like i'm i'm, I'm kind of picking on them because uh yeah i i guess uh it's just like some some recent interactions i've had have like updated me towards like feeling like there's more dysfunction than I would have thought. And I'm not like that well plugged in. So I can't say like how much I'm um, sort of like being unfair or generalizing too much or something. But I, I this is just like my impression from some recent. Uh, when you think recent interactions is uh, recent events or just like personal interactions? Um, I think, it, you know, it's 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 personal event, interactions, it's events, it's reading things online. It's like a lot of it's like second or third hand. You know, it's not even like me personally, like having bad interaction with somebody. It's like other people complaining to me about their their interactions. You know, so it's like that's why I have to like caveat it and say like, you know, may, maybe I'm like some of this is pretty off base and I don't want to like tar the whole community or something. Um, but what were we talking about? Agendas. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. OK, so like, you know, so so I think the way that like people talk about agendas and everyone asking me about agendas feels like a little bit weird or something. So I think, you know, uh, yeah, people often have like some sort of like a agenda, but I think agenda is like a very grandiose term to me. It's like oftentimes I think people who are like at my level of seniority or even more senior in machine learning would say like, oh, I'm like pursuing a few research directions and they wouldn't say like, I have this big agenda. That's like, yeah. And so, so I think um, my philosophy uh, or mentality, I should say, like when I set up this group and started hiring people was sort of like, let's get, you know, talented people let's get people who like understand and care about the problem let's get people who understand uh machine learning let's put them all together and just like see what happens um and like try and you know find people who who i want to work with who i think are like going to be like nice people to have in the group who have like you know good personalities but social um who seem to like yeah really understand and care and, and all that sort of stuff and um so it's more like you know it's not this sort of like top down like i i have the solution for alignment and i just need an army of people right. to implement it i just don't like yeah, I, I've described it as like something of like a laissez-faire approach to running the lab, <laughs> um, which is, you know, to some extent, I have that luxury because of getting uh, funding from, you know, the existential safety funders. And so they, they're they not placing a lot of demands on me in terms of the outputs of the research, which is, I think, pretty unusual. So like, I'm pretty lucky to have that compared to a lot of academics. So I think a lot of times in academia, you have, you know, a lot more pressure to like produce specific things because that's what the funding is is asking for. Um, so you, you have like both the 
let's say, um, flexibility of, of choosing kind of what um, research you want to do. But at the same time, you're trying to like go for the rigor of the original uh, academic uh, discipline. Yeah. So, I mean, one thing that if you look at like the, the people arguing about this stuff um, in the Bay and online and in person, like the, the sort of, you know, this non-academic existential safety community, which includes, you know, some people who are in academia as well, but um, people know, you know who I'm talking about. <laughs> Anyways, if you, if you look at what's happening there, like people just have very different intuitions and they're kind of like argue about them occasionally and then they go away like, you know, with their different intuitions and then they go off and take actions based on their intuitions. And, um, you know, it's kind of st struck me at some point that like, hey, maybe we can actually like, you know, do research on these problems and like try and understand, you know. So like we, we talked earlier about this example of like, uh, the AI in a box and like does it and learn to like reverse engineer the outside world or something So right. like that's something where people have really different intuitions and it's like we can just approach that as a research problem And so like let's start doing that kind of research to actually see like what the situation we're in is and trying to understand, you know What what like the sort of safety profile is of these different systems um, and different ways of building systems and like different you know approaches that I think historically uh, the existential safety community um, like people back in the day, like at Miri and stuff, were like very down on any approach that looked like at all sort of hacky or heuristic. They were just like, oh yeah, that's not gonna work because super intelligence. Mm -hmm. um, and I think a lot of those are actually like really promising uh, to explore and we should figure out like how far they can we can take them. Just to get a, a, some pushback on the like, uh, people like doing research on their intuitions and uh, everyone in the Bay having kind of similar, uh, you know, uh, way of, of doing research. I, I, I think when we talk about Miri, this is like this, for people who are listening to this or watching this that don't know about it, it's like Machine Intelligence Research Institute, like created like 20 years ago-ish. And I think it kind of produces less research as of right now. And a lot of people who are there now are work at Redwood uh, Research that is doing like more empirical, um, like ML work that is um, like focused on like aligning the like actual models we have right now instead of like weird decision theories. Um, so I think, I think, you know, like right now, I think the, the state is like much better than it was like maybe like 10 years ago. Well, I don't know. I mean, cause like, I think you have to sort of agree with their intuitions to some extent, maybe to believe that the research they're doing makes sense. Cause if you, if you really like have the intuition that this stuff just isn't going to work because it's not addressing the core problems, then you'd say, well, this is just like a distraction and this is harmful and I think like it's plausible that that's the case, right? Like alignment might just be like really hard and all of this stuff that people are doing is just like not gonna cut it. All it's gonna do is like create the illusion of alignment at best. So you're saying if you're not like interacting with the entire like research community as a whole, you might um, be in a situation where you end up doing the, the wrong things because you don't have enough like peer review people looking at the problem? No, I'm just saying like, um, like it would be good to know like if these, sort of, you know, prosaic, pragmatic AI alignment things are going to work or not, and to try and get evidence for, like, if you think they're not going to work, which, again, I say, like, I suspect that they won't, um, like, for AGI or, or like, super intelligent systems, um, try and, like, get good evidence for that being the case, and that's, that's like, part of what I'd like to do. Right, so, you, so you're trying to, like, see if, like, prosaic alignment, or, like, aligning current models will work? Yeah, like, uh, you know, let's let's take reward modeling as a concrete example. Like, is reward modeling going to, like, work? Is it going to, you know, get systems that actually have the right intentions, the right motivations? Is it going to give you that? And I think it's not. Can you explain reward modeling for people who are, like, not into the field? Yeah, reward modeling is just the idea of, like, learning a reward function, you know, a model that, that encodes a reward function. Um, and specifically... Uh, it might refer more more specifically to like learning from human preferences and things like that, where the reward model is not learned from like inverse reinforcement learning. So not just learned from observing a human, but learned from like more explicit human feedback where the human says like, I like this, I don't like that. Or, like this is better than that uh, for different behaviors. And these kind of reward modeling are already like developed or uh, deployed for like, I think does InstructGPT for uh, Adobe AI uses uh, reward modeling at all? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Um, it's used by, I think like, Something like this uh, is used by like Anthropic, by OpenAI, maybe sometimes by Google. I think Google is like a little bit more, um, just like on the imitation learning side for like the fine tuning of alignment. Um, yeah, but so yeah, I, I just want to push back to, to, to like there's like people I guess are, are, are like have moved to like like more 
industry level uh, alignment where you use like actual machine learning and deep learning in the, and just it's in, in, in not like all weird. So I guess like some people have asked on Twitter, I think it was Ethan Perez at Entropic asking, um, why did you go into academia to this kind of research? Like, is there like something in academia that you cannot do like in industry? Yeah, um, it's a good question. I mean, I think uh, I wrote some less wrong blogs on that on that topic, uh, <laughs> so people can look that up um, if they want to see more of the answer. But um, like, just to kind of do a short version of it, one is that I really wanted to like run my group and like have students and um try and like you know mentor and credential people to grow the field um and another is that i wanted to like really i don't know maintain like strong ties with like academia and machine learning and academia because i think we still have a lot of work to do in terms of like uh i guess excuse me like i i think yeah educating people in academia about like the safety concerns and um you know winning hearts and minds is how i put it uh and i think you know i hesitate to say educating because it sounds so like uh pretentious or whatever um because you know i think there's a lot that we can yeah patronizing yeah i think we can like learn a lot from people in machine learning as well uh definitely and i think it's like just really important for these two or maybe you want to say like three communities because there's both like the sort of uh people outside of academia who are working at big companies um and then there's the people outside of academia who are like doing you know independent research or like doing more like conceptual stuff stuff that's like closer to the muni school um or maybe aren't doing anything but just like talking about it or something or trying to get into the field um i think all these people like need to talk to each other more and understand each other more um or like yeah i think i think there's like a lack of understanding and uh appreciation of the perspective of people in machine learning within the existential safety community and vice versa and I think that's really important to address, especially because I think, you know, I'm pretty pessimistic about the the sort of technical approaches. I don't think like alignment is like a problem that can be solved. Like I think we can like do better and better, but I think, you know, to to have it be like existentially safe, the the bar seems really, really high and I don't think we're gonna, gonna get there. So I think we're gonna need to like have some ability to coordinate and say like, you know, let's not pursue this uh this development path or let's like let's not deploy these kinds of systems right now. Um and for that, I think to to have a, a high level of coordination around that i think we're going to need to have a lot of people like on board with that like in academia and like in you know the broader world so i don't think this is like a problem that we can solve just with you know the diehard people who are already out there like you know convinced of it and trying to do it and i, I think it depends on um i guess the timelines you have i guess like convincing academia takes a while and um if if you have like 20 or 30 years, maybe you have time to convince a lot of people. And and I guess like we're at a stage where, you know, there is like enough time for people to like read Super Intelligence or um, Human Compatible AI, or like all those books that were published in the past, you know, 10 years. And if, if people have still not, you know, updated on all the evidence or either they've been living under a rock or they haven't, you know, like it's not convincing enough or not, um, or, or maybe we're wrong, right? But um, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure like how much more can we convince them or maybe there's like something about incentives, right? And maybe we need to like, you know, create a field is something where people can publish or, or, or do actual progress um, before people can move to this field. Yeah, like incentives have something to do with it for sure. And like social incentives. Um, but I think, you know, to some extent, like people have been living under a rock in the sense that I don't think most people in machine learning have like much awareness of uh the existential safety and alignment and i think very few people have like seriously engaged with it um i mean you were mentioning how like nobody at mila knows what alignment is right and one I, person Br brendan yeah so <laughs> so i don't think that's a mila thing i think that's how it is generally in machine learning it's like there's a lot of ignorance how would you explain it or like define it i think we've I, I, I still haven't heard like a, a, a nice definition or oh sure i mean like i think uh so there's like three different definitions for alignment one is like getting the system to do what you want the other is getting it to try to do what you want and then the last one is just like existential safety and like everything that's involved in that and i think the second one is like the best definition because the first one is kind of trivial and the second one it's hand wavy because it has this like try thing in it but i think that's basically what what it's about in my mind is uh 
like intent alignment it's sometimes called just like get the system to like be trying to do the right thing so i guess like most people always talking to at mila w w would just like say like of course of course we want models that do what we want like because models will do what we want if we design it properly or something it's not an actual problem and i think i think that's like one crux is like people are mostly like optimistic about the thing doing what we want by default yeah i mean i i would like a car that is exactly like a normal car but like you know makes the environment better instead of worse so like why won't the car do that uh because people don't really care about um having their care. car well some people care yeah but like they don't care as much as they should because it's a collective action problem so like yeah i i'm, I'm just i guess i'm kind of surprised like that this analogy isn't more like apparent to obvious people or it doesn't seem to land uh that hard a lot of the times because this is how i think about it for the most part um yeah and then the other thing is i mean like that's the first definition that's why i don't like the first definition is because some people just be like yeah we want the system to do what we want like come on um but even that i mean like not everybody's doing that like a lot of people uh in research are like no i'm a scientist i'm trying to understand intelligence or just like make things that are more intelligent and like the the whole like you know the it does what we want is more of like an engineering point of view i'd say all these coordination problems like i think under underlying this is like you know why do we build you know the cars that pollute instead of like trying harder to build cars that like don't pollute it's because um you know you can make more money that way basically and at least in the past hopefully that's changing um I just I just feel like um, solving like your point of view is is kind of like attacking capitalism and 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 not actual like um, like coordination problem. That like I feel like your solution to this problem would be just like change the you know economic system we have. I mean, okay, like we're back into politics now. <laughs> so, <laughs> Sorry. Like, so, so like, I don't, I don't think, uh, I don't think there's like an alternative that's like ready to go. I think there are like incremental changes that would be helpful, like the stuff they talked about, like moving to approval voting or something like that. Um, I don't think like capitalism is really like I, I think it's usually not a good term for like what people are actually talking about. So like people talk about like global capitalism, and that's sort of pointing at the same thing that I want to point at as like you know the world is not run well <laughs> in some sense. Um, but I think like you know, capitalism and communism are like these things that like don't actually exist. They're sort of like these abstract ideals that have never like, you know, they're like if you talk to like hardcore communists uh, and like a lot of them will say like, yeah, all of the existing like quote unquote communist regimes that have ever existed sucked, but they weren't real communism. And like you can, you know, if you talk to like hardcore, you know, free market fundamentalist libertarians, they'd probably tell you the same thing. Like none of this is capitalism. There's like all these like state handouts and like the you know, the, the government is way too involved in everything. Um, and I think, you know, the reality is like that they're both right, right? I mean, like the, the system that exists is not communism. It's not capitalism. It's some sort of like, you know, uh, thing that incorporates various, <laughs> it's just very complicated. And it's, uh, yeah, there's a lot to be said about it. But I, I just want to say like, it's not like, I, I definitely reject the like simple like thing of like, oh, it's capitalism or like, you know, being like anti-capitalism. I think it's just a, a really bad framing on it um and you can redefine capitalism so that it becomes a good framing where you say like capitalism is you know this historic like the system that we have and like the sort of historical systems that it grew out of and then i think you have like maybe more of a point but like then i start to like lose confidence because i just I, I do like try to study history but I, i'm not an expert so you know i think everything is about timelines and if if you have 20 or 30 years you might have a shot at like you know, fighting Moloch or like changing the system or like um, building better incentives or solving coordination problems. If your timelines are like five years, then you might want to focus on the technical problem instead, uh, five to 10 or something. Um, and uh, I have a hard time thinking that, uh, I don't know, um, we can do stuff like convince uh, more than like 50% of academia um, in like timelines that are very short um and i guess maybe um you could like maybe um address your timelines or or, or, or in which world you think you are um because I, I i think this is like the main reason why i'm not not really like yeah. an understanding your position i think timelines are likely to be short but i think it doesn't all come down to timelines uh so i think like there's there's a couple other big factors one is like the tractability of the problem so like i think if you uh if you're optimistic about a technical solution, then it's like, oh yeah, it makes sense, but I'm not optimistic about one. So I think that's like, you know, a lot of people I would say are in the community are sort of like, oh, uh, coordination is just like a non-starter. So we need to do a technical solution. And I'm like, 
definitely not the opposite of that, but I'm closer to the opposite of that. Um, so is, is is basically like coordination, like uh, um, like something that is like n not as worse as as a, a solution that doesn't work. So like you you don't see coordination as like easy, but it's like um, not as hard as the alignment problem that is kind of you don't see any solution at all. Roughly speaking, something like that. Yeah. Um, it's more like, you know, these things can complement and substitute for each other to some extent. Yeah. But I think like we need at least some amount of the coordination. Um, yeah. And then another thing is like, you shouldn't just say, here's my timelines and it's a number because like timelines aren't a number, right? They're a distribution. And so uh, you might want to invest in something that looks like more likely to pay off over long timelines, um, even if you think timelines are likely to be short because you still have a significant amount of mass on long timelines. And uh, another thing is like neglectedness. So just like, if you look at the community right now, there's not that many people like doing what I'm doing, I would say. So I think it's like, you know, there's, there's a neglectedness argument. And then, I mean, like, you know, when it comes down to it, to be honest, like part of it is just, this is what I want to do and it's personal fit and stuff like that. <laughs> um, so um, basically you, you try to do research that will pay off in after your median because um, it will still happen like more than 50% of the time. And this is where you have the most leverage. Like, no, I mean, that's, that's like, an argument that I was like sort of gesturing at and like that's you know part of my reasoning but it's it's more complicated than that um so another thing is like you know you were talking about like getting 50 percent of the machine learning community convinced uh, to like take this stuff seriously in the next like five or ten years and like man wouldn't it be great if we got like 10 percent of them right yeah um, good, and yeah. so I think like right now there's just tons of talent in the machine learning community that hypothetically could be you know directed towards this uh, so to the extent that you think it is more of a technical problem which again I'm like kind of don't think so but to the extent that you do like you should still be really focused i think on getting machine learning researchers to work on that technical problem or like the, the associated technical problems and it's kind of odd to me that people don't seem to be doing that as much um how, how do we how do we get them to actually you know well i mean one thing is just like be clear about what the technical problems are so to the extent that it's like actually you know a, a problem that has is not like you know this pre paradigmatic thing but it's something that we have sort of like figured out how to formalize or make progress on then like you know, uh, grants, right? And like talking to people and being like, here's a thing that you should work on and here's why. And, you know, I've talked to some people who I think are fairly like open-minded and like think about, um, you know, think, think, think seriously about the social impacts of AI and the future of AI and uh, don't find these research directions very convincing either um, in the machine learning community. So I think like, that's interesting, right? That's something that we should be like, talking about more maybe i think in terms of incentives um the, the question is like are people are, are people altruistic or not i would say like people who are like interested in this kind of fields are people who tend to like want to do you know good or like something that is positive and uh, if people are just like interested in doing like interesting research maybe like we need to like reach a level where the research is like interesting enough that you get people that like just like nerd sniped by the idea and want to do like technical research on it um so i guess it depends on like your priors and like how like what's the percentage of the people that are actually altru altruistic and like how easy it is to make like the, the problem like interesting um like it, it it will not be as fun as uh building smarter and smarter models i think i i feel like i disagree with a lot of what you said so like one thing is i think um yeah like for some people i think they're they're into sort of like the gamified and like engineering thing of just like look at the cool thing that i did or like look my number is higher um and that is like a lot of people's motivation i think but i think uh if you are more like maybe intellectually minded or something and you care about like understanding stuff and like doing like fundamental new work then i think alignment is like a great place to work because we do have like a lot of this stuff that is still kind of pre-paradigmatic and i feel like in mainstream ml a lot of this is just like kind of hacky stuff and it's just like you know fiddling around with stuff until it does this or that and like there's sort of interesting detail level questions but like the high level conceptual stuff a lot of the time is like you know we we know back propagation we know td learning we know like you know building a model of the world we know like planning you know all these basic concepts are already there um and so it's more you know a matter of just like implementing them in the right way and figuring out the details uh for, for a lot of the work there not to say like there aren't like interesting new like conceptual breakthroughs happening sometimes in like mainstream ml um as well but so that's one thing I disagree with. What else do I disagree with? Oh, I think the whole like framing about altruism. I mean, I think everyone should be like very skeptical about altruism, like their own altruism, everyone else's altruism. Like, I think it's just like, it's uh, like, I don't think we should like totally taboo talking about it. And like, you know, I think it's like, you know, there's this effective altruism thing. And I think it's like nice that people are like saying, hey, we should be more altruistic and like try and try and 
there's a spectrum between like being egoistic and and 100 altruistic, right? But I think um, a lot of people are more on the egoistic side than the altruistic side. Yeah, I mean, I think that's true, but I think it's also like the. I think it's like hard to say what any any one person's motivations are, and I I don't want to say like oh that's what's going on here is like right. people who aren't altruistic enough don't care and so they aren't working on this because I think that's just like really uh yeah not charitable um and like sort of Dismissive. probably um like pretty inaccurate for a lot of people's actual motivations like I think you know under the hood people's motivations are like complex and messed up for the most part <laughs> um, and i think like even people who are like trying really hard to be altruistic or thinking think of themselves as like altruistic it's like you can explain what they're doing without reference to altruism except as like sort of a buzzword or like a you know a lot of the time so yeah I, I would view a lot of this as like more cultural i do think there is like some difference in like personality or mindset that plays into this so like I think some people are um are more ambitious and some people are more like want to have a big impact and I think you know probably um that's that's like a factor here um and then I think yeah but most people who have that I think would also be saying like they want to have a positive impact um where I think like some people are more like it's not really about me and my impact. It's more about like just being a good person and like, you know, it's sort of um, ego, egotistical or egomaniacal to like try and be the the hero who like has a big impact and we should just be more cooperative and like this is more of a problem to address as a community or a society rather than like unilaterally by like, you know, doing some amazing piece of research that like, you know, solves the alignment problem or something. Um, so you're saying that the people that are, um, that tend to have a high impact um, kind of want to have a positive impact and like want to do something useful and we just we need to like shift this person to do the thing that is actually useful for AI or like in the direction of um... no no uh, <laughs> <laughs> so I think most people don't have that mindset I think most people are more in the mindset of like I just want to do my thing and like you know uh, be nice to people and like live my life and like you know, be free to do the stuff that I want to do. And like, if there's something that is like really outrageous, then I want to like take a stand, you know, in, in my own little way. Um, and I think that's like kind of like most people's attitude. And I think that's a totally like fine attitude, especially in like normal circumstances or something. And I think what we want to do is we want to like turn that kind of attitude, to, like people who have that kind of attitude to like uh, make this something that they feel empowered to like take a little stand on and like to work on if they if it if it strikes their fancy and I think it's more like right now what we need to do is like get people to understand and appreciate the concern and to like sort of remove the taboo and like uh, try and um, I don't know like address the the sort of legitimate aspects of the criticisms that people are leveling at these ideas but uh, sort of yeah like get people to understand and appreciate the legitimate parts of the concerns as well. Right. So um, you're saying basically like people just do their, their own thing until like something very outrageous happens and then they're like, no, I don't agree with this. And so we would just like need to um, find a way of presenting the problem where people can like see where, why it's outrageous or like why it's like important. And, and then they might just like do the, the moral thing for, um, for this this partial problem, because um, it, but the, the 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 thing is, we haven't framed the problem in a way that they understand is so, that it's in, important. They just think it's like kind of weird or like I don't want to manufacture outrage. Like I think outrage uh, will I don't know will will happen more naturally maybe uh, or something. Like I think it's more just like yeah, getting people to understand and like yeah, I think there's a lot of like yeah. Uh, just lack of basic understanding. So, so yeah, earlier you were talking about like, oh, people have the, had the chance to like read human compatible or superintelligence. And like, I guess what I've been telling people recently, like it, it'd be great to like have more data on this actually. I think it'd be cool for people to like run a survey about um, how much people like in the machine learning community know and understand about like alignment and existential safety and the ideas there. Um, but like my current uh, recommendation is like by default, you should assume that the average machine learning person you're talking to like 
has seen a headline and a picture of a Terminator and like that's it. Like they they didn't read like the first sentence of the article. Um, maybe they haven't even seen any of the articles themselves. They're just aware of their existence. Like it's kind of that level of awareness that I think is probably the like the maybe not the average but like the median or the mode. So in like if this is the level of outreach uh, that has been achieved, then the the question is like how do we spread more than like one headline to uh, ten thousand researchers? Like how do we spread this to you know, one article or one blog post. Yeah, um, I think it's, you know, it's, it's uh, you talk to people, you try and create, you know, more um, sources for them to learn about it. You try and encourage people to learn about it. I mean, it's it's like a lot of little things to some extent. There's not like one, one big solution here. If there are possibly like a thousand people watching this video, um, what would be like a, um, like technical problems or like papers they can look at that to like actually like you know um make them think like oh this is a real problem or like this is important like is there like any research or direction you think are yeah that's a really good question so the problem is i'm like not up to date on the most recent stuff because i just haven't taken the time to read it so I, i know there's like you know recent things that people have written that are an attempt or, or like produced that are attempts to make this more um clear and legible and stuff like this um I guess like the old like AGI safety from fundamentals from Richard No, I think it's one. Yeah, so I I did look through that at some point. I felt like it was still uh, going to like turn off maybe your average machine learning researcher or a lot of machine learning researchers because it's like a little bit too out there or something. I think it's like it's a good resource for people who are already like you know sympathetic to these concerns probably. Um, but if you're just trying to make the basic case, I mean, I will say like. My my understanding of this as like a problem of just like lack of awareness and like something that is more about like educating people rather than like winning arguments came uh, to from a large extent from like running a reading group on human compatible at Mila in like maybe 2018 or 2019 something like that I'm not sure when the book came out you know shortly before the pandemic let's say um and yeah it, it seemed like it just went really well compared to the reading groups that i tried to run earlier on like asap and and ethics uh, topics and i think it was because it was just like you know well written accessible um and just like really kind of like walking you through the the basic uh case from like sort of a popular science point of view and i think i was like taking you know like random like alignment or safety papers and like trying to talk about those and like you know it's a very broad and disjointed field like there's so people were kind of just like what is this all about anyways so i didn't realize like how much um how much basic stuff people like hadn't been exposed to uh, and that was giving the sense that like yeah maybe this is just a matter of like exposing people to the ideas in a format that isn't like sort of i don't know isn't uh like framed as like this you know thing of like well are you altruistic or not are you a good person or are you like a bad person who like builds bad ai and like isn't trying to do safety um or like you know sort of like are you not like accelerated timelines building by building (laughs) AGI? yeah or like just sort of well like you know obviously uh agi would just like do this or that when you know these these sort of like hand wavy arguments presented as if they were you know more than that um so something like coherence as uh, the book of Stuart Russell, Human Compatible AI, that presents a basic case from like a unified, you know, maybe like a Gen T RL framework and like the solution is like IRL, inverse remote learning. And... I guess it's the solution in, in his book is like cooperative IRL, yeah, cooperative, yeah, but, um, yeah. which, you know, I don't, I don't think that's the solution, but. Um... <laughs> it's, it's at least like pretty easy to understand and like yeah. elegant. Yeah. Um... But yeah, I think I think there's like it's it's not clear to me to what extent we need to just like spread the ideas that we already have versus like developing new framings on things. And um, it does seem like the latter is also important because I think everyone is just really anchored on like what I call like the the spherical cow uh, version of the problem, which is sort of like if you didn't read Super Intelligence but you read some reviews of it, you get this picture of like yeah, it's just about like uh, AGI is soon. It's gonna like go from zero to sixty overnight. Um, it's going to be a super intelligent agent, um, and then no matter how we try and control it, we will fail, and then it's going to take over the world and kill everyone because of instrumental goals, and like that's it. And like it, you know, multipolar stuff could happen, but like you know, it just doesn't matter because then one of them is going to become the best one, and like it's just going to have a decisive strategic advantage, and like 
you know, and, and I think actually, you know, it's been a while since I read Super Intelligence, and I'm not sure I ever read it end to end. I think I read it in like bits and pieces uh, scattered around because I had read a bunch of the like papers and stuff that it was based on before that. Um, but I think there was actually a lot more nuance in there. So I think it, it like kind of gets a bad rap in terms of um, like, I don't think it just presents this like simplified, you know, spherical cow version of the problem. But I think it's easy to come away with that as like the main, you know, the main threat model there. Um, so maybe people have, have heard stories from other people telling them about super intelligence like 10 years ago and 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 now it's hard for them to like update on like more realistic scenarios where it's like threat models that are just like poor seeking or like more like a con continuous takeoff and uh, models are like unaligned um, in a more like nuanced way. Um, yeah. When you talk to like other academic peers or colleagues, what are their reactions to what like to your arguments? Do they say like, oh yeah, seems sensible? Uh, have you like convinced anyone um, that it was a problem? Yeah, I mean, I don't want to like um, generalize. I guess. Yeah, yeah. Well, I was gonna say I don't want to like attribute people's interest or like uh, you know being convinced of this as a problem to me solely. But there are people who I've talked to who have said that like I've had a significant impact on on how they think about it. So I think. I think I've had some impact. Um, I think, yeah, I think like one person was like, okay, I'm convinced <laughs> at some point. I was like, yes, uh, but you know, maybe I should follow up more. <laughs> but uh, let's see, uh, what was the question? Oh, how do people react? So yeah, I mean, I would say when I was still like a master's student, when I just started, um, people reacted like very dismissively and just like, that's just like crazy sci-fi nonsense. I can't believe you like take it seriously. Um, and then maybe like within a few years, once people had like a little bit of exposure or like maybe had just talked to more people, or maybe it was just that I was becoming like more senior or something, or like was, uh, presenting more of a, more of a case or something, it seemed like the attitude changed. It was more like people, you would still get that from some people, but, um, it was kind of more of a like, oh yeah, okay, whatever, like fine. You can, you can think about that. You can think that like, I'm not going to make fun of you for it. <laughs> and then maybe a couple of years after that, it was more like, I, I thought like people were like, you know, pretty respectful of it. Um, and I thought like, oh, great, this is progress, but I'm not sure how much that is like, just, uh, so, so I felt like, oh, it's being treated like any other like research topic, um, which is, which is definitely progress. Um, I guess I also felt sometimes like maybe, uh, it's not in the sense that like people would sort of be like, okay, cool, but they wouldn't want to like actually dig in and talk about it in more detail the way that, you know, people often will when you're talking about research topics. And so I was like, hmm, I feel a little bit like somebody who's like talking about like being part of some, you know, cult or something. And people are like, yeah, yeah, that's nice. That's great. Like, and, you know, <laughs> I don't want to like learn so more about, about that it. sports, <laughs> um, you know, just like change the topic. Um, and uh, now I think it's become like hard to to tell because like, I think, it's harder to get like people's real uh, opinions when you are like a professor, you have like more status. So people are like more deferential and stuff. Um, you mean like your um, students or um, or like because like I guess like if you talk to like other professors in Cambridge, in the UK or in the US, uh, maybe they would like have like similar reaction. Like, do you, do you think alignment is getting more into the mainstream, let's say in the UK, in London, Cambridge, uh, Oxford, those kind of things? I think like the historically the macro trend is like, yeah, it's just going more and more mainstream. Um, and like, again, alignment versus existential safety. I think they're both going more mainstream. I think alignment is like maybe having a bit of a moment or had a bit of a moment with like foundation models because, and, and you know, people are like also like rolling their eyes at this because they're like, okay, fine tuning is alignment now, whatever. <laughs> but um, there's at least this obvious problem with foundation models where it's like you, the pre-training objective is not aligned. It's like you want the model to like, you know, answer questions honestly, or like do translation or something. And like, it can sort of do some of that stuff, if, like, especially if you prompt it right from the pre-training, but the pre-training was just like predict the next letter, right? Um, and so there's just this, this alignment problem just staring you in the face. I mean, we were talking about this way earlier in the interview of, uh, you know, you can't really tell if it's capable of doing something because you don't know if it's trying. So like, they're just a huge part of the problem with these big models is just like, just to get them to try to do the right thing. Um, and that's, that's the alignment problem as I, as I think of it. Um, yeah. So, but, but again, like a lot of people, you know, might be interested in that, but just from the point of view of like, you know, it'd be great if we could get this thing to like drive a car. So can we like, you know, get it to try to drive the car and then maybe it'll be good enough at driving the car if we can like get it aligned in that sense with that task. 
Um, it's hard to disentangle like capability versus like safety um, when you're trying to like you know have more capable models that actually do what you want them to do. Like um, I know of some people at DeepMind who are like not exactly working on uh, the alignment team, but still like do like um, a lot from human feedback or uh, you know aligning the large number of models to do exactly what you want them to do and. Um, yeah, it, it's hard to say, and I guess like you will have like people doing the same. And I think I think at OpenAI, the InstructGPT paper was like the first time the alignment work was actually used to like improve their product, and not just you know theory. Um, I'm not sure about that. I I had the impression that they were doing some sort of fine tuning as well for um the other models that they that were available on the API. Um. To do things like you know, make them less racist and stuff like that. Right, maybe. right, right. Bias and um, yeah, yeah. And so I guess like existential safety. I, I'm 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 like sort of optimistic that people are going to that there is going to somewhat organically be like a big um, sea change in in the machine learning community's mindset about this in the near future. Um, yeah, I think I, I think Ilya Sutske Sutskever said like. Um... In a tweet that it, it thinks like in two or three years alignment will see uh, the same um, you know growth as deep learning had like a few years ago. Oh yeah, I think he stole that from me. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I've been I've been for at least a year now. I've been saying that sort of stuff in talks. It's a subtweet. Uh, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I've 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 said like you know GPT three is like alignment's Alex Net moment, um, and you know you can see this in terms of like. Uh, yeah, I think a lot of different ways. Wait, wh why GPT three? Oh, just because that was like the the big thing where it was like, oh yeah, alignment matters now. Like because like we were just talking about, like if you want to get GPT three to do the stuff that you want it to do, you have to align it. Um. So did you see like a shift of like people um being more convinced of alignment being a thing after GPT three? Like it was easier to like convince people. Um, I don't know. Hard to say. I guess I I feel like. It's just hard to judge because, you know, there's been like one machine learning conference since the pandemic. Uh, GPT-3 was what, like during the pandemic, right before the pandemic? I don't remember. It's all a blur. <laughs> um, Wait, there was no conference since 2020? Um, uh, I guess I should say the, the only conference I've been to since the pandemic was ICML 2022 um, in-person conference. Yeah. And it was like, you know, still not back up to it, the, the pre-pandemic levels by far. Um, and that's like where I would, you know, maybe have the most of these like interactions and conversations and sort of like get a sense of where the where the machine learning community is at with all this stuff. A lot of people on on on, on Twitter wanted to get your take on like what would like a solution look like. Imagine imagine we solved alignment. Oh, you said you, we cannot solve alignment. <laughs> imagine everything goes well. What's the like world in which you know David Kruger um, made it happen or something like one of your solutions or or, or someone's solutions where. Yeah, it's, it's it's hard for me to imagine like things going well, <laughs> going well in the way that like isn't just mostly due to luck, unless we, you know, solve some of these coordination governance problems, so we can we have the ability to say like so. I think a couple things uh, I'd like to see happen are like people, um, there, there's like a broad awareness of like understanding of and like appreciation of existential safety concerns um, in the machine learning community and in like broader society. Um, and then we start to like, you know, take this very seriously as a problem and figure out like how to coordinate around it and figure out like what, you know, what uh, what the rules should be of the game in terms of like, how are we going to address this? How are we going to do like um, proper testing? Like what sort of, you know, regulations might we need? How can we enforce international agreements? Um, or, you know, like who, yeah. Uh, so, so all that sort of stuff probably has to happen. Um, and I think that's like roughly speaking necessary and sufficient. Like I think there might be extreme versions where it's like, you know, let's say that uh, in 10 years time, just like anybody on their laptop can like with three lines of code, like write, you know, this AGI system that like can become super intelligent overnight and, and kill everybody or something. Then like, you know, it's not clear what we can do. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, I think like, it's it seems like sort of yeah roughly speaking necessary and sufficient to like have a good um like level of appreciation and awareness and like uh being willing to and able to like say you know 
we all agree that this is like a sketchy, dangerous way to like to proceed. So let's not do it. And then we don't do it. Um, and that might be like, you know, a gradual thing where like over time the bar raises or like maybe it goes down because like we learn more and things that we were worried about, we realize aren't actually concerns. But like this has to be like an ongoing and adaptive process, I think. And then I think at the end of the day, we also like assuming that we can, you know, build quote unquote aligned AGI at some point, then we also want to like take the time to solve sort of the, um, I forget what people call this, but the like the whose values are we loading or like what are we lining to like the alignment target. I think that's like a big, you know, sort of social uh, philosophical problem that like, I don't know how to answer. Nobody right now knows how to answer. And like, we want to take a long time. Like we want to really be able to like sit back and take our time, like addressing that. And we want to be able to do that in a, in a climate where um, the competitive pressures that currently exist that drive people to just like, you know, go full, go full steam ahead, uh, trying to like gain more power and, and like build more powerful technology and like manipulate each other where those are like managed and under control. Um, so that's what we should be aiming for. And then from there, you know, hopefully we can uh, actually figure out, you know, what what we should be doing with this kind of technology. Before we even we've recorded stuff about um, you know downstream performance on all uh, downstreaming tasks and uh, learning curves, and I thought it would make sense to just start with um, you know learning curves. Why do they matter? And I think you've published like a bunch of papers on this. So yeah, what what do we mean by learning curves? Decomposing them. What kind of research have you done? Yeah, I mean it's pretty like open ended um, scientific kind of inquiry. Like we're just trying to understand better the learning process and generalization and like. Uh, study how that happens, you know, throughout the course of training. So that could both um, help you figure out like if the model is generalizing the way that you want. So like if it's sort of picking up on the right concepts in the right way, or what sort of factors make it more likely to do that. So once we have good ways of like studying this, uh, then we can sort of do interventions on the training process on the data, etc, and see how this changes like these these profiles of um, the you know the, the the downstream performance over time or the sub performance on different subsets, all that sort of stuff, um, and then that can help us you know design uh, algorithms that make sure the model generalizes in the way that we want. The other thing that we can do is we can try and you know predict and um, discover, and so it's like it's a little bit like interpretability research, um, but it's sort of in my mind it's maybe a better uh, or more sensible like starting point for that, uh, or, or it's at least like complementary to work on like, you know, mechanistic interpretability. So you can understand a lot about the model by its behavior on particular examples, I think, and how that behavior changes over time. So uh, this might also help you detect things like deception or power seeking as they like start to emerge if they start to emerge. I think we talked about deception a lot with uh, the last episode with Ethan Caballero on, I think, a paper you co authored, so broken North Carolina laws we were mentioning. Yes. And a lot of people in the comments um, were kind of dubious that the thing would be like, able to like predict so many things or that um, you know it was actually modeling something of interest because you would like fit a different um, model or like have different parameters for um, every single downstream performance. So, like, yeah, do you, can, what do you have to say to like, those comments? So I, I know there's a lot of, you know, a lot of uh, ways that you can attack this paper in a sense. And I think, you know, it's, there's a bunch of limitations. And I think most of those limitations are, um, are things that we're aware of and that are important are, I guess, like, yeah, uh, I, I think there are significant limitations on, on the other hand, uh, I guess the thing that you mentioned specifically, like fitting a different model for all the different, um, downstream scaling things like I, that just makes sense to me i don't know what the sensible alternative would be like you could you know you can do this in like some sort of hierarchical way or like you know uh, where you say we have sort of the the er uh scaling curve and then these all sort of descend from it and you can sort of maybe compress um the total number of parameters you need in some way doing something like that um you know, we've talked about doing things like Gaussian processes or like more like heavy duty ways of modeling these as well. And right. like, I don't know that, that there's probably a sensible way of doing that. I think if nothing else, um, that like some sort of uh, Bayesian approach would make sense for model selection. Cause we have this N, which is the number of breaks in the curve. And right now, um, like Ethan's basically just fitting that by hand, um, or just, you know, 
uh, and ideally we'd like to have a method that automatically selects how many breaks to use. I think that would really improve um, the overall like value of the method. Can you do the same like as for like KNN or something where you just like increase N until you, um, you have a, you know, and you select just the, the, the best value for like the, the, for N equals one, two, 10 or something? Yeah, I mean, I guess it's, it's like sort of an empirical question whether or not the hyperparameter N is something that you need to worry about overfitting. Um, and if you don't need to worry about overfitting, then it's fine to just, you know, trial the values and see which one does the best. Um, yeah. Uh, so maybe, maybe, maybe that's fine in a lot of cases. I think in general, uh, you know, like one thing is that we do these experiments in the paper, right? Where we do find that like the broken neural scaling law with one break is like just really does a good job on these uh, tasks from the paper uh, from earlier this year. And um, that's that's where they compared basically scaling laws that don't have a break and then some new thing that's sort of like a broken neural scaling law, but I think just not not as well crafted. And, you know, on the majority of the something like 100 or so um, scaling curves, it outperforms all of the four alternatives, but there's like a significant number of them where something simpler that doesn't have any breaks outperforms. And so, um, you know, that's a special case of, of the broken neural scaling law with zero breaks. So mm -hmm. it'd be nice if we could just automatically choose whether or not to include a break or not. So that's the kind of thing where, you know, it's the broken neural scaling laws, but the broken is at zero. So it's just neural scaling laws. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If you, if you wanted to do it the way that you're describing, you, then you need like a validation set, which would be like extrapolation points. And I think, um, I think there should be a way to do this just like based on marginal likelihood instead, which uh, doesn't require looking at validation performance or extrapolation performance. It just asks essentially like how sensitive is the fit of this model to the data to um, to the, gosh, what is it, to the data or to the parameters of the model? Anyways, it's trying to say like, you know, if if this model is like robustly good at uh, fitting this data, then it's more likely to be um, a model that generalizes as well. So you mentioned zero break, and then there's one break and two breaks, and um, I think most 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 tasks are have one break. Um, and w w one thing you guys were able to model was double descent, uh, which was never done before, and people weren't trying uh, very hard. Um, and I think in one of your talks you mentioned that. Um, you know, like you, you, you can model double descent and, and working in kind of the similar way. Um, so yeah, yeah, this one thing we were research is um, tackling to do. Yeah, so that's that's the third uh, of these three papers. That's um, a workshop paper at NeurIPS uh, that I mentioned earlier. So yeah, I think that was kind of just, you know, uh, so this is a paper by Xander, a visiting undergrad from Harvard and Laura, one of my PhD students. And I should mention the metadata archaeology paper. That's with uh, my student Schweb and uh, Natarshan, um, and then also external collaborators, uh, Tegan Maharaj and Sarah Hooker. Um, yeah, and so this like rocking double descent paper is basically just saying, hey, these are maybe like look like pretty similar phenomena, you know, in one case, actually, so when you zoom in on like the Grokken curve, you see that there's a little bit of double descent going on already. Uh, so the main difference is just like, how long does it take for the second descent phase to kick in? And also, I guess, Grokken was only ever shown in terms of learning time. So we also uh, showed that it can occur in terms of the number of parameters in that paper. Um, and the thing that I think was like, interesting to me or most interesting to me about that paper so far like it's you know it's a workshop so it's still work in progress was uh we were trying to model um how the overall performance is a function of like some sort of decomposed performance on like different subsets or like how it relates to the model learning different patterns within the data and i think that's really interesting thing to to try and model um so so what yeah. kind of performance were you measuring? Was it like train loss, test loss? Um... Yeah, yeah, just like training and test accuracy. So basically we're, we're looking for a model that's like very abstract and then maybe we'll figure out how to, how to ground it and test it, you know, and stuff like this, but just a very high level model that sort of says, here's the rate at which you're learning about different patterns in the data, or like here's the different patterns that, you're, that you've currently learned. And then 
from that, we can predict your training and your test performance. And in particular, we can show, you know, how a model like this could give rise to something like double descent, where, um, you know, the, the key, the key features of this model then are that the patterns sort of compete to figure out which examples they're going to classify and some of them generalize better and some of them generalize worse. So as you learn these patterns, you can sort of see that, you know, you're learning more stuff, so you should be able to like predict more stuff, but then your predictions might not generalize as well, depending on which pattern. So like if you start learning a pattern that doesn't generalize as well, that might actually like hurt your performance, um, your generalization performance, even if your training performance is going up. So it's a, it's a very abstract model of what it would look like, but it's not a, a concrete task yet. Yeah, yeah. It's, so far, it's just a, entirely abstract, yeah. So yeah, I guess there's like a um, another paper um, you've been uh, mentioning in one of your talks is uh, assistance with large language models, which one, which is like closer to what people do now with you know, foundational models. Yeah. Um, and I think you can relate it to LMN because it's like kind of close to uh, cooperative IRL as well. Yeah, yeah. Do you want to say yeah. more about paper? Because I tried Googling on, on, on Archive, and I think it's not out yet. Yeah, that's right. So it's, it's another workshop paper. Uh, the idea here was just like, can we get language models to act as assistants to humans, and in particular, to like ask clarifying questions from the human about what they want from the system? Um, and so we just did like the, the sort of simplest first pass at this, where we just have sort of the the language model has the option of either answering a human's query directly, or if it doesn't find the query clear enough, it can ask a clarifying question, get clarification from the human, and then answer. And you know, the idea is it should sort of do whichever of these is appropriate based on how clear the, the original query was and how well it understood it. So we like build a, a new data set um, you know, with human labels for uh, these this extra data about like, the, the clarifying question and the clarification. Um, and then we sort of train a model to act as a human stand-in. And then we train another model to like interact with that human stand-in. And then at the end of the day, we find that like, you know, it can in fact learn to do this sort of basic assistance task. And what, what's a human stand-in? Oh, it's just like a, a language model that's been trained to like play the role of the human in this interaction. So the, the high level pitch here is like, get language models to interact appropriately with people. So like you have some idea of like what the interaction protocol should be and you want to train it to follow that interaction protocol. And one way that's like much more efficient plausibly of doing that is to like use a human stand in instead of having to actually uh, have humans interact with the model all the time during training. So you limit the amount of feedback by, you know, having the AI do the feedback somehow. Um, yeah. So in this case, the AI isn't actually giving the feedback or what I would describe as the feedback, that's the part which, you know, determines the loss. It's more like giving some of the context. Yeah. And so at the end of the day, like the, the agent is going to look at, you know, the original question. And then if it asked a clarifying question, the whole you know, transcript of original question, clarifying question, clarification, and then have to predict the answer. And the answer is uh, still coming from like the actual, you know, data set that was constructed by people. But the clarification is coming from the human stand in. So the data set has the question and clarifications. Uh, yeah, what's exactly the data set? Um, let's see. What exactly is the data set? <laughs> uh, so oh, I'll mention this is a paper with uh, Igor and Dima Krishnanikov. Um, so let's see. I think the original data set just has uh, questions and answers. And then we collect, in addition to that, we collect uh, clarifying questions and clarifications. And then um, we also train, you know, this human stand-in to produce those clarifications, and then we train the language model with that human stand-in uh, to get like more interaction data. Actually, like I'm, I have to admit, I'm, I'm not sure if we train it with the human stand-in or just evaluate it with the human stand-in. So, yeah. As you mentioned, it's it's work in progress. It's not it's not an archive yet. So maybe check in in a few months. A few weeks. Yeah, it is at the machine learning safety workshop and a few other workshops at NeurIPS. So <laughs> probably the video will be out after NeurIPS. Um, another cool paper that I, th I think you can find in archive uh, that relates to what we did talk about about generalization is uh, Golden generalization in DeepRL with yeah. uh, Loro as well as you mentioned before. Yeah. And this one is very cool because I've seen it on like a bunch of like alignment blog posts um, for like an example of um, yeah Golden generalization, uh, which is kind of important for alignment, right? Yeah, totally. Um, so this is a paper that I uh, 
hopped in like at towards the end basically so laro and the co-authors um had basically <clears throat> written uh the paper put it on archive before laro joined my group uh but then i was like let's try and get this accepted at a machine learning conference so they actually i think they submitted it to iClear previously and and it was pretty borderline but didn't get in um yeah anyway so i'll say about the paper uh Basically, I think in a way it's a pretty straightforward thing from a machine learning point of view, which is that sometimes your model doesn't generalize the way that you want it to. And we know this is like super well-known, well-studied problem in machine learning at this point in the context of computer vision, especially where you have like spurious features and the cow on the beach and, and you know, I won't get into it too much, but a lot of people will know what I'm talking about there. Um, <clears throat> And this is more or less the same problem or same type of problem in a deep reinforcement learning context. So the, you know, the, the figure one is basically you have this agent that's trained on this coin run uh, set of procedurally generated environments that are basically like different levels of Super Mario Brothers. Uh, hopefully, you know, kids still know what that is. <laughs> um, and uh, so, you know, it's trying to run to the end of this level, avoid all the enemies, and then at the end of the level, there's a coin, and it gets reward when it picks up the coin. Um, but uh, the coin is always at the end of the level during training, and so what it actually learns to do is to go to the end of the level, and if at test time you move the coin around, so it's not at the end of the level, it generally ignores it, maybe even tries to avoid it because it thinks it's like an enemy because most of the things in the level are enemies, and just runs to the end of the level, and, you know, so it's, it's, so it's, it's basically generalized misgeneralized the goal. So it's it's behaving uh, as if its goal were to get to the end of the level as opposed to to pick up the coin. And so that's kind of like, you know, a nice demonstration in a way of uh, something that people have been thinking about and talking about in AI safety for a long time, um, which is, you know, the idea that you can train a system to do one thing, but it can end up pursuing a completely different goal from even, you know, the one that you trained it on. If I were to do the devil's advocate, um, you could say that the model like kind of generalized properly because like his training data was just like a coin plus like a wall at the end and so you just... oh yeah yeah i mean there's no there's nothing in the training setup that tells you whether the wall or the coin is the the goal yeah so it's 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 perfectly correlated in you know in the figure one experiment so it's just totally unfair to the agent in a way to say <laughs> um you're misgeneralizing it's just like it's it's underspecified uh, but i think that is reflective of like the real world is in general things are underspecified um and you know we do a number of other experiments in that paper as well um which show that this is uh, this can happen to a, to a much lesser extent even if you do randomize the coin location somewhat so the correlation doesn't have to be perfect and it can happen in like other contexts. Um, what, but yeah. What other contexts? Um, so I think the the coolest experiment in my mind is this keys and chests uh, experiment. So you have a little grid world type maze, and the agent is going around trying to pick up keys and open chests. So every time it opens a chest, it gets a reward. To open the chest, it needs to have a key. Um, and let's see, how does this work? In the training environment, uh, the chests are plentiful and the keys are rare. Um, and in the test environment, it's the opposite of that. It's backwards. And so what the agent learns is basically like, I don't even need to worry about the chests. I'm just going to bump into those, you know, randomly as I move around. What I need to do is make sure I have enough keys that when I find a chest, I can open it and get the reward. So it basically just tries to collect keys, even though there's no reward whatsoever for having a key. It's just an instrumental goal to being able to open a chest. So I think this really... Um, exhibits the instrumental goal seeking behavior in a, in a nice way. Is this an, an actual experiment or just like a thought experiment? It's an actual experiment. Yeah. So, so there, that's, that's, I think sort of the main contribution of this paper in a way is just to run actual experiments to show this. Um, there's one other thing I want to mention in terms of contributions. So this is, um, one of like my contributions when I actually got involved was to basically emphasize how this differs from the supervised learning spurious feature thing, which I think is important because um, otherwise, you know, I think for a lot of people in machine learning, this would just be like really boring <laughs> paper <laughs> because, you know, like I mentioned, people are really familiar with this kind of problem. And that's uh, that you can actually like formally distinguish two kinds of generalization failures in, um, in the context of RL. And so like, I think the original paper was already talked about this intuitively that you know, there's the kind of failure where it just does random stuff and it's not doing anything sensible. And then there's the kind where it's like, 
clearly behaving like an agent that has a goal and pursuing that goal and you know usually quite effectively like it, it does in fact get to the end of the level it does in fact collect lots of keys um and yeah so you can actually formalize that in the context of rl by basically saying you know we have some distribution over goals and then we're going to ask like does this agent um is it well modeled uh, as something that is you know pursuing one of these goals and if you have a MDP, so if you don't have a PondDP but an MDP, then this actually, you know, is so you might say like this distribution of over goals is kind of arbitrary, but in an MDP, it's it's really not. So like uh, something that is clearly not agentic in an MDP context is something that just does different things every time it's in the same state. So like optimal policies and MDPs generally um, should be or at least can be deterministic. So if you see like very random behavior, then you know that thing isn't very agentic. So because it takes the same actions every time, you can say that it's like closer to like an agent that has a goal? Yeah. So like if it if it does the same thing every time it's in a certain state, that that makes it look more goal directed. And of course, um, if you have some more prior knowledge about what are reasonable goals, then you can make this work even in a POMDP and, and so on and so forth. But yeah. Um, so w one line of research of trying to have like less agents um, and you know control the amount of you know dangerousness of of you know models we deploy in the world is your kind of graph. You you, you often point at like um, safety performance trade offs. Um, I, this is something I remember from watching one of your talks. Um, yeah, what are the like safety performance trade offs? Maybe there would be like a, a nice picture explaining while you while while you talk on the video. Nice. Yeah. Um... So I guess there's kind of uh, two things I want to say about this uh, <clears throat> about this plot. So one is that um, originally to me this was just kind of like an argument for why existential safety is a hard problem, and that's still maybe the main point of that plot. Usually uh, that plot, that that figure, that slide when I show it, um, and actually just this morning or last night. Um, I realized like a, a, a pretty crisp way of sort of explaining one of my, what I think is one of my main cruxes with a lot of the AI, AI existential safety communities. So I want to mention that now. Um, and, and it sort of is exhibited by this diagram. So I think a lot of people talk about like, maybe I said this earlier in the interview as well, like a lot of people talk about like solving alignment or they talk about this technical problem that like can in principle be solved. And like their main concern is maybe that we won't solve it in time. Right. And I think that's just kind of a, a really terrible way of looking at it because I think there will always be some amount of safety performance trade-off, no matter how good of like technical, you know, progress we make on alignment. So I don't view it as something that like can be solved perfectly uh, at any time soon anyways. And then we can just, you know, use the alignment techniques. Um, so I think there's always going to be in the, so, so I guess you could say, for a lot of people, they're worried about like us under investing in research. And that's sort of where the safety performance trade offs are most salient for them. But I'm worried about like the development and deployment process. So that's where I think most of the risk actually comes from is, is from like safety uh, performance trade offs in the development and the deployment process. So for whatever, you know, whatever level of research um, we have developed on alignment and safety, um, I think it's not going to be enough that those trade offs don't just go away. So we're always going to have these things that we can trade off, like um, to to yeah, these these knobs or levers, these ways that we can trade off safety and performance. But what are those levers? Yeah, things yeah, yeah. we can trade off for? Or... Yeah, so um, so like one example is you can just like test your system more before you deploy it, and that means that it takes you longer to deploy the system. So like you don't get to to send it out there in the world and start reaping the benefits of having that system acting on your behalf. Um, I guess you have a bunch of them written down there. <laughs> yeah, so. Uh, and yeah, another one is like keeping a human in the loop. So in general, um, a lot of the times, you know, having a human sort of overseeing the the system's behavior and saying like, oh, this doesn't look safe. I don't know what's going on here. Let's let's shut it down. Or let's not let it take that action, whatever. That's something that could make it a lot more safe, but it also can really harm the performance of the system because a lot of systems you want to be acting like at superhuman speed, for instance, um, do more testing, keep a human in the loop. Um, you can like only deploy systems that you really understand how they work. So like, you know, you have some sort of, you know, interpretability tool that you really trust and, you know, have a good reason to trust. Uh, or you have like some sort of theoretical, you know, reasons to expect that the behavior will be safe. Um, 
And you know, the more such requirements you place on the deployment, the the fewer systems you can deploy, and especially the fewer like sort of powerful black box systems that you can deploy. And um, yeah, you know, you can also just like add a bunch of hacks that say things like don't don't leave this room, like don't hit people, you know, just like <laughs> you can you can just come up with constraints on the behavior of the system and uh, hard code those. And of course, the system might find ways to sort of get around them. Um, that's that's a classic concern for AI safety. But the point is, like, maybe it won't. And, you know, maybe you will, you know, have all sorts of tripwires that just shut the system down. You know, that's gonna give you some saving throws, as people like to say, um, where if the system starts trying to, you know, take control or do do some sketchy stuff, it might get shut down instead. But at the same time, those might trigger, you know, when you really want your system to still be on and still be functioning. So, um, well, and yeah, go ahead. I guess like my internal Yudkowsky is kind of screaming, saying that, of course, when the thing is like human level or, 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 or smarter, like it's able to, you know, um, reach a strategy of advantage, it will like not care about those kind of things. So I, I guess for me, I, maybe I have a different, um, point of view than like you or Ethan, that once we reach the point where it's capable of, of, of doing dangerous things. Like it will like be able to like bypass those like safety um, measures or uh, those kind of like triggers uh, those like fire alarms. I mean, I think that's a very binary way of looking at it, and it's actually much more complicated than that. So, you know, if you have something that is AGI, like a person, and you put them in some sort of you know room that they're not supposed to get out of, like you know a prison, a lot of the times they don't manage to get out. If you have a really smart person and you put them in prison, they still typically like don't find some clever way to get out. Even if they like, they have like access to like ten to the nine years to think before acting because they like try to maximize the probability of them succeeding, like Alpha Go style. I don't know, like they reason at like different time frames. Yeah, so I mean, this is just the question of like how much smarter is it going to be than a person, and in what ways, and things like this. So I think. Um, yeah, I, I think so. Maybe I need to jump to another thing that I need to say about this, which is that like this is oh, there's more. I gotta I gotta go through the other ones. But uh, first, I just want to say like people have very different intuitions about this, but it's just intuitions, and like that's the point. Is that uh, so? First of all, there are all these things that I think are like safety performance trade offs, and I think this is like why X risk is high. But also, we don't really know how these performance tra safety performance trade offs look. Um, so like people have different intuitions about it, but we haven't done the research to actually figure out, you know, if you have a system that is this smart in this way and plans this far into the future, like, can it get out of this kind of box for instance? Right. Um, so yeah, that's, a, that's another one just to like finish going through my list here. And I think there are others. This is just, you know, a list from the slide. So like long-term planning, like how far does the thing plan into the future, right? If it makes more long-term plans, it's more likely that grabbing power is going to pay off. If you're trying to maximize the number of paper clips over the next like two seconds, you probably just make paper clips instead of like making you know nanobots and all that. How do you how do you limit planning? Do you just like make it myopic and only care about like one step? Like wouldn't it be like incentives to have you know agents that can plan in the in the long run? Yeah, I think we talked about my paper on this uh, earlier, right? So it's it's an open research research problem, um, but sort of you know maybe you just yeah use myopic RL. And it just works, um, as long as you like make sure that you don't slip up. Um, yeah, and then you can also like just design your system in such a way that it's meant to accomplish some sort of narrow task. So that's related to having like a short a short horizon. But you could also say it's more about like the domain that it's operating in. And then along with that, you can say I'm going to try and like restrict the sensors and actuators or restrict the knowledge of the system. So make it you know some sort of savant that like only understands you know how to, uh, you know, build a better paperclip and doesn't understand anything about, you know, the, the wide world out there, maybe it doesn't really know that people exist in any sense and stuff like this. And of course, um, a lot of this does, yeah, go against like, full on generality of like the kind that humans have. But I think um, it's it is kind of an open question, like how much you can have something that still um, has the same like fundamental, qualitative reasoning processes that humans have but is maybe um, thinking over a shorter horizon or maybe lacking some of the knowledge that we have, has like a different world model that doesn't include some of the strategically relevant factors, or maybe it does include something like 
oh yeah, by the way, there's some, you know, um, omnipotent, omniscient being who uh, will punish you if you ever do anything wrong. Um, I feel like the way we train our models right now, we just like train on all of ImageNet or you know, all of Reddit's blog posts with more than three karma to like create a, the pile or something. Like, of course, humans are in the loop. Like, how much, uh, how much, like, of course, humans are in the training set. It's like very hard to construct a, a, a data set without humans or like without uh, information about um, it being an AI or something. Yeah. So this this goes back to again to other stuff we discussed before, where it's like, okay, so there's some information about humans through the human labeling process, right? If you let's just talk about ImageNet, right? Is it enough to like reverse engineer all of human psychology and like figure out how to hack, you know, humans and like manipulate us? I would say probably not. I think you know, no matter how smart you are, if all you see is ImageNet, you really don't know much about people. Um, and of course, you know, people are going to have incentives to train systems that are have more performance at the expense of safety right so they're going to have incentives to train systems that have more sensors and actuators that have more knowledge about the world etc um that's kind of the the point but so there's there's the there's the sort of strategic point of like people are going to turn these knobs to unacceptable <laughs> levels and then there's the technical question of like so how do these knobs actually work um and yeah i've been thinking about the strategic point for a long time the technical point uh is something that i just recently decided would actually be a really interesting thing to focus on in, in research. Um, so I was talking about these safety performance trade-offs and I was talking about um, the narrowness of the system. So when I've been talking about this stuff recently, I that's the way that I usually motivate this work on reward hacking. So this is a NURPS paper that we had um, this year with Yoris Gelze, Nikki Howe, uh, and Dmitry Krasnikov. So the first two are PhD students at Oxford and Mila. And it's a pure theory paper, which is kind of cool. So it was my first nerves paper, my first pure theory paper. Um, you are did all the theory. I just like checked it and, you know, <laughs> and and uh, I guess I, I came up with like the, the sort of the definition and the motivation of the paper. Um, and so the, the question that we were asking is like, can you have a reward function that is safe to optimize? So that isn't the true reward function, right? That is somehow maybe simpler or um, more narrow. So, um, yeah, which would be really good for news for alignment if this was the case, right? Because then you could say like, oh yeah, learning everything about human values seems really hard. So if you think about reward modeling where you learn the reward function, that's probably a non-starter, but maybe we can just learn, you know, how to behave in this specific domain or like how to perform this specific task and uh, encode that as a reward function. And then if the agent optimizes that reward function, it'll be fine because like it won't, uh, do anything bad according to like the real reward function, you know, to the extent that there is a real reward function, but um, that in, the, the real reward function here is meant to, you know, represent sort of everything that we care about, um, all of our all of our values or preferences or whatever. And so- The, the, the task is like good reward specification, like um, having the perfect outer alignment, so the, the, the good reward specification. Yeah, yeah, so you want like a reward function where um, it's a, it's a proxy for the thing that you actually care about and maybe it's much simpler and, uh, but if you optimize that proxy, like it's going to be fine. You won't mess up according to the real reward function. So, um, we formalize that in this definition that says a pair of reward functions is hackable. So like the proxy, uh, could hack the real reward function if it's possible for the reward to go up according to the proxy. And I guess I should say like the returns, like the, the value, the expected returns, um, when you change policies while well, simultaneously it's going down according to the real reward function. So if like during the course of learning, uh, you could be like, oh, this is great. I'm doing better, you know, according to my proxy, but actually you'd be doing worse according to your real reward function. Then that means that your proxy is hackable because, you know, learning in general is going to try and drive up the reward according to the proxy. That's what you actually point your optimization at. Um, so like one, an alternative would be maybe, uh, you know, you have, these reward functions are always like increasing, you know, monotonically. Um, it, when one goes up, the other one goes up, um, but they don't go up by the same amount. That's one thing you can imagine happening. Another thing you can imagine happening is like one of them goes up, but the other one stays constant. So like maybe the real reward is going up or even going down, but the proxy is staying constant. When say re reward here is like um, expected reward, uh, like expected some reward over time of uh, a policy, not like reward on on a particular state, right? Yeah, yeah, basically, yeah. Um, yeah, uh, <laughs> so like the value of the policy, but uh, you know, in practice, you might just look at the the reward of these, like in experiments. Um, but whatever. Um, 
yeah, like the how good how good the policy is doing according to that reward function is what what I mean to say. So yeah, you could have like your proxy is just like not changing, but the real reward is going down, and you say like, oh, that's bad. The real reward is going down, and that's true. That's bad, but it's not going down because you're optimizing the proxy, right? Like in in because you aren't increasing the proxy. So like the optimizer isn't pushing you, you know, I, again, like maybe, uh, maybe it depends in some sense on some inductive biases or details about how the optimizer works, but um, your, <laughs> your optimizer isn't going to be like pushing you in the direction of something that just looks equally good according to the proxy. So there's no like optimization pressure that's driving that decrease in real reward in the case where the proxy is staying constant. So we're only really worried about the case where there's optimization pressure that is hurting your true reward. So like you are sort of training the agent to get more proxy reward, but, and that's why, you know, it's getting worse real reward. And so when you're putting too much pressure to get proxy reward, the uh, real reward goes down. Yeah. So that's, that's like reward hacking according to our definition. And we say, you know, reward function, pair is hackable if that can ever happen so if there's any pair of policies such that like moving from pi to pi prime looks like an improvement according to the proxy but it looks worse according to the real reward so it's like when you can um move in policy space from one point to another where you're kind of improving on the the hackable reward so the, the proxy reward but you're like losing on the other one yeah and so you say don't do this you're not all to do this um yeah so so we just you know it's it's sort of like throwing out that definition and then analyzing the properties of the definition. So um, the, you know, basically, if you want to make sure that you never have reward hacking, one way to do that would be to find a, a proxy reward that isn't hackable. Um, and, you know, one of the main results of the paper is basically that's not really possible unless you restrict the set of policies you're optimizing over. Um, then the only like non hackable reward functions are like the trivial one where everything is equal. Um, or like something that's equivalent to the original reward function. So I guess like if I were to talk as a machine learning researcher, I would say like, yes, but you're only talking about MDPs or like grid world or something. And um, I, I know you, you haven't said this, but I feel like if you're talking about like a more continuous like Muzoko environment, like the space is so like uh, large that um, like, it, like there's, there's like infinite number of policy and it's like hard to um, you know, compared to like you're not like moving from one to another in a disparate piece, but like it's like a continuous set of policies, right? So it, it would be like impossible to you know apply this to continuous environments. Um, no, no, no. You can you can apply it just fine there. I mean, so basically what we're doing is we're abstracting away the training process, like the learning curves. So there's this characteristic thing you'll see when you actually see reward hacking in practice sometimes, where like the real reward and the proxy are both going up, and then at some point the proxy goes up and the real reward goes down. And as soon as that happens, you know, your optimization is producing a sequence of policies. So that means that there was a policy before that happened and a policy after that happened. Right. And that's that pair of policies that I'm talking about. Right. So you're only talking about those two and not um, and not like the infinite number of policies in between or. Like... Yeah. Yeah. Because you don't actually visit those. Right. Like you still do a discrete set of step of, you know, optimization proceeds by these discrete steps usually. Yeah. Right. So there's like a finite number of, of optimization. Yeah. So so basically I mean I think the it's it's I think it's a really cool paper. I didn't learn as much from it as I would have hoped because the the definition ends up being really strict, which is kind of, you know, not surprising because we're not saying anything about like how bad it is when you have hacking. Like how how much does your real reward go down? So it could go down just by a tiny amount and maybe you don't actually care that much. Um and there's a lot of other like caveats and like sort of interesting details I, I could talk about more, but um, I, I just encourage people to look at the paper or, or you know, reach out to me. What's the name um, of, the, of the paper? Oh, yeah. It's uh, defining and characterizing reward hacking. So that's, you know, basically exactly what we do in the paper. We define it and then, and then we characterize it and show, you know, when you can have these hackable or unhackable pairs of reward functions. Um, but yeah, so like it kind of to the extent that you can draw conclusions from this, and I, I think um, you know we're doing some empirical work on reward hacking as well that sort of suggests the same thing. It's basically, you know, you shouldn't really think of your reward function, your reward model as a reward function. Like, there's no reward function out there that you can just say like, let's just optimize the hell out of this thing, except for the true reward function, which is like, you know, does that even exist? To the extent that it does, it's incredibly complicated. It has to account for all of our preferences over the entire you know future and things like that. Um, so we should really think about this as just like a signal for learning and not as like the goal that like we should never actually say, I really want to optimize this reward function. Like in, in and you know, maybe I guess maybe that's fine in a very like 
constricted sense when you're like operating within a uh, a narrow environment and you're able to keep the agent like operating within that narrow environment. Um, but uh, yeah, um, that's that's sort of the the takeaway. I feel like it's pretty close to one of the papers that were published before, like AI safety grid rules, or maybe like the other ones in the similar branch where they have this like performance metric, and then there's like the reward metric, and they just have like different. Um, and I don't know if it's different rewards, but they have like different metrics for, and they they select the curves going up or down. Yeah, so that's like more empirical though, right? So so there's been like a a lot of a lot of discussion and like a decent amount of empirical work on this. Um, but we were trying to you know approach it theoretically and so like actually define it explore the properties of the of the definition and you know like i said it would have been great if we found out that like these things exist and i think we could have you know there's a world that i was imagining we might live in where it's like actually you know here are the ways that you can sort of interpolate between this reward function that expresses all of your preferences about everything in all fine-grained detail and this one that expresses no preferences about anything and so you can say like you know this reward function only really expresses my preferences about like this narrow uh, set of behaviors. I don't really care about behaviors outside of that. Um, and like in a sense, you know, maybe you can have a reward function like that, but it, it sort of supports this uh, line of thinking from the existential safety community where like if you leave things out of the reward function, then they might be like set to extreme values. Like the agent will just continue to view them as instrumentally valuable, even if you haven't specified any terminal value for them. So this this approach doesn't really seem uh, promising. And if we want to keep using reward functions, we we need to just think about them as sort of like a hack that we need to find some other way of dealing with. Or you know maybe you can strengthen the definition somehow or, or tweak it somehow and get some more interesting results um, other than you know just sort of the negative results we have. Or you can restrict your policy space and just like only consider a finite number of policies. Then then you can at least find non-hackable, non-trivial pairs of reward functions. We don't really know much more than that based on the results of this paper. So sort of a first step. You could do a lot more theory. Ethan Kebeler asked on Twitter, what is it like to play poker with Ethan Kebeler? Yeah. So what is it like to play poker with Ethan Kebeler? Yeah, we, we played poker back in the day. And I guess at one point he came in and was like, oh man, like COVID, why are we still here playing poker or something? We have to like tell everyone, get the word out. Um, yeah, that was you know, before when, when people were still saying like, wash your hands and like, it's probably not even going to be a thing and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, I guess, uh, what else? Maximum entropy is, is what he said he was doing, but I have no idea what he was actually doing. But did he win? Like, I'm not sure. I think he would like you to believe that he won more than average. Um, <laughs> okay, because what, what Irina told me, there was like legends of him like winning every round. Yeah, I think that's bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> this is, you know, he, <laughs> building the legend, right? <laughs> you were also a legend at Mila. So I, I went to Mila. I asked re re random researchers, hey, what do you think of alignment? What do you think of exit risk from AI? And people knew you. So there was this guy, Brendan who told me like he remembered you, yeah. but most of them like didn't care about alignment at all. So as a, as a researcher, as a AI alignment researcher, did you fail your, your job to like spread the <laughs> message at Mueller? Um, I don't think so. I mean, like, you know, I spread the message. It's just like, do people want to hear it? And what do they do when they do? Um, yeah, it's, it's been kind of like, surprising to me um how this has happened i keep thinking that people are going to like there's been a lot of progress right in terms of people understanding uh existential safety and taking it seriously but i keep thinking the progress will be a little bit faster than it is so i'm not sure what's up with that but i have a bunch of theories but i don't know i don't feel like getting into them necessarily um <clears throat> do we have we have one hour to please <laughs> Yeah, I mean, the thing is, it's very, it's just kind of like speculation. So I think, um, well, one thing recently that somebody pointed out to me that maybe I've heard this before, but it really, it really just struck home. It's like the availability heuristic is this idea that you estimate the probability of something by like how, how readily you can conjure it to mind. And I think uh, the out of control AI takes over the world and kills everybody scenario. There's like no version of that, that I can think of that doesn't seem kind of wild and implausible in some of the details. And, you know, that doesn't stop me from taking it seriously, but I can see why a lot of people would 
you know, if this is uh, how they are thinking about it, they're just like, well, how would that even happen? And that's something that people say a lot is like, you know, so what, it's going to like build nanobots? That sounds like bullshit. Or like, you know, their robots don't work. So it's going to have to like solve robotics. And we're like, some it's somehow going to do that like overnight or something, which obviously doesn't have to happen overnight. And like, you know, what about the future world where we have robots? Because, you know, that it's not like we're never going to build robots, but um, right. I digress. Um, so do you think an AI takeover or like a strategic advantage from AI will come after we build robots? I don't know. Yeah. I think like all these details are just like, who knows? Uh... I want to ask a question that uh, maybe will be at the end of the recording or at the beginning. I don't know, yeah. but I haven't asked enough. What are your timelines? <laughs> Wait, 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 we talked about this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but we, we haven't said an actual distribution or uh, you, you've said like you have a distribution, but um, when when do you expect recursive self-improvement or um, general uh, human level AI or whatever you want to define? I don't know, like pretty soon maybe. <laughs> <laughs> pretty soon. What's pretty soon in, in your lifetime? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think, uh, I think I'd, I'd be pretty surprised if we don't have AGI in my lifetime. Yeah. Um, so what's your what's your median for AI? This conversation is over. <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> I think it's a, it's a good ending. If you don't, <laughs> I think it's good. Yeah. <laughs>